good. Uh, Um, <clears throat> good morning uh, and welcome to the 33rd meeting uh, in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everyone, as I normally do at this point, to switch all, off all mo mobile phones um, uh, as they can often uh, interfere with the sound systems. Although you will note that um, um, some of us are using tablet devices and, and, and indeed this isn't instead of our uh, hard copies of the papers. Um, we have apologies today from Dennis Robertson uh, and Graeme Day. Uh, welcome as here uh, as the SNP substitute um, and uh, for the first time uh, uh, to, to the committee. Um, and can I at this point just uh, invite Graeme to declare any relevant uh, interest if there is any, Graeme. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, I thank you for your welcome, but I am not aware of anything I should declare. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to uh, agenda item number two, where, which is a decision on whether to take item six in private. Uh, item six is our approach to uh, legislative consent memorandum. Um, and can I have the committee's uh, uh, agreement to take uh, item six in private? Thank you. Uh, item three um, uh, is um, the first um, uh, subordinate legislation, the first instrument uh, w that we, we have uh, a total of five negative in instruments before us th th this morning. And the first instrument is the Public Bodies Joint Working Health Professionals and Social Care Professionals Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-307. There has been no uh, motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, are there any comments from members? Uh, I, don't see, I don't hear any comments from members. Is, is the committee uh, therefore agreed that we make no recommendation? Agreed. Thank you for that. The second instrument the, this morning is the Public Bodies Joint Working Membership of Strategic Planning Group Scotland Regulations 2014 SSI 2014 um, Again, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, are there any comments from members? No? Uh, they, I therefore uh, ask the committee to agree that we make no recommendations. Uh, is that agreed? Agree. Thank you. The third instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Content, uh, uh, con content of Performance Reports, Scotland Regulations 2014 SSI 2014 326. Again, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, are there any comments from members? No. Um, is the committee therefore agreed to make no recommendation? Thank you. The fourth instrument, products containing meat, etc., Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 289. Again, there, have, uh, be, there has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the incident, uh, instrument, uh, and of course the details are in your papers. Uh, are there any comments from me members, uh, Richard, and then, yeah. and, 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 and then Mike McKenzie? Just one Rick. comment that the, um, the products which are not for sale, I think, is brain, lungs, and foot but doesn't include spinal cord, unless I'm misreading the policy document summary that we received. Um, and I just wonder whether that is the case or not. It's not something that can be answered today, but I just wonder if, yeah. uh, the, if, if someone of our clerks could maybe check again to see if that is the case, because spinal cord, was, uh, spinal cord products was one of the things in, involved in the BSE, and if it's been omitted, that yeah. seems to me to but be an omission. We haven't asked anyone to come along this morning, but I mean, we, no. we, obviously, we, we can uh, ask uh, that that, that, that comment be yeah, noted, our, noted our, at this time. Our review says such as, so it may be included in the actual order, but I, okay. I 
Uh, thank you, Convener. I think I'm correct in saying that the uh, Government are given a commitment to correct the points raised with them by DPLR, the, um, and I think we should welcome that. Okay. But, uh, you know, in noting these comments, then, uh, uh, is the Committee agreed that we make no recommendation? Agreed, yeah. Agreed, thank you. The fifth and final instrument, um, Food Information Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 312, there has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument, uh, and uh, you will note the details in your papers. Are there any comments from members? There isn't. Uh, the committee, is the committee agreed, then, that we make no recommendations? Thank you very much. We now move to agenda item number four. Um, which is uh, a return to our early years inquiry under the, the health and inequalities theme. Uh, this will be our final evidence session on early years. Um, and uh, we have with us this morning Sc the Sc Scottish Ministers, and we welcome both with a special welcome, of course, to Maureen Watt, who is um, uh, here uh, as uh, first time as a Minister, um, uh, Minister for Public Health. Welcome, Maureen. Aileen Campbell, uh, whom we uh, have met before, uh, Minister for Children and Young People, Alex Young, Team Leader, Tackling Poverty, and Dr Fergus Millen, Head of Creating Health Team Public Health Division. Uh, and Chris Roberts, Early Years Collaborative Team Leader. Uh, Carolyn, uh, Carolyn, uh, Carolyn Wilson, Operation Policy Manager, Child and Maternal Health Division, Early Years Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Um, and I, I think what we intend to do is get a short opening statement from uh, the Minister. I, I presume that the Minister have agreed which one will lead off first. Well, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Convener, thank and you. thank you uh, for your uh, special welcome. If, it's, uh, if you don't mind, we'd both like to make a short opening. Um, statement. So uh, thank you for this opportunity um, <clears throat> and I look forward uh, to working with you all in my new role. Um, I will seek uh, to set the broader context for our discussions this morning and then uh, my colleague, the Minister for Children and Young People, will give the committee greater detail on the policies that fall within her portfolio. Uh, of course, I've been trying to get up to speed with my new portfolio, and I would want to say that the subject and remit of this inquiry, inquiry is one that I and my colleague here feel strongly about. Scotland's health is improving across the piece, with people generally living longer and healthier lives. But I'm also acutely aware that despite the significant efforts of this and previous administrations to tackle health inequalities, it does remain a blight on our society. I think this committee has previously acknowledged the complexities of resolving Scotland's health inequalities and developing policy solutions which can minimise the impact of the differences in power, wealth and resource which underline, underlie the inequalities in health that we see in our society today. You will know that the First Minister has made tackling inequalities one of our stated objectives and we remain determined to address the gap in rates of chronic ill health and premature death that impact upon communities right across the country. I know that this committee has focused on health inequalities in the early years because that's where, as we as a society, can make the most difference in long-term outcomes. We know that getting it right in the early years and even pre-birth can have a positive effect on the health and well-being of the child and the family. Prevention and early intervention should be what drives our work and that of our partners. <clears throat> that is why this government has had a strong focus on early years right from the point we were first in government in 2007. We look for community planning partnerships to have a focus on the early years in their single outcome agreements, highlighting the fact that addressing health inequalities in the early years is not a job just for the NHS. We need all statutory agencies and partners to work with their strengths, skill and assets of the communities. We have also focused on developing strong evidence-based policies in the early years 
that deliver the proportionate or progressive universalism that we believe will make the difference. So, for example, in our work on antenatal inequalities, we have taken on the messages of the need for a universal approach to ensure we reach all those in need of services, focusing on improving access to maternity services. We have developed a robust framework to support maternal and infant nutrition, including breastfeeding, recognising the importance of nutrition both pre- and post-birth. We have taken forward the Family Nurse Partnership, but recognise this only reaches a very specific segment of the population, albeit those at higher risk of poor outcomes. There was a clear message uh, from the session from GPs at the deep end and others that continuity of care and consistency of approach are crucial to reducing health inequalities. All our early years policies are striving to achieve this. That's why we've invested significantly in strengthening universal services by increasing the number of health visitors to ensure that all families can access the services they need through this universal gateway of provision. But we're also clear to be, we, are, we also need to be clear health inequalities cannot be reduced by health interventions and policies alone. They are linked to and derived from the wider inequalities agenda of socio socio-economic and welfare policies. As you know, we as a government do not yet have all the levers to address these in a comprehensive and coherent way, but that doesn't mean that we can do nothing and we must do all we can to meet this socio-imperative. And I'd now like to hand over to the Minister for Children and Young People. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Committee. And thank you also for allowing me the opportunity to make an opening statement as well. Now, I think it is significant that you have both myself and Maureen Watt in front of you today. And in fact, you probably could have invited a number of our uh, fellow ministers as well, because the issue of health inequalities in the early years is one that crosses all portfolios and, as Maureen has said, agencies beyond government as well. Now, I welcome the opportunity to be here because the early years policies is an, uh, issues and issues surrounding early years are ones that are close to my heart in more ways than one with the imminent arrival of this bump uh, at the end of the month. But we want to make sure as a government that Scotland is the best place in the world for all children to grow up. And we have a number of policies aimed at doing just that. Maureen has already mentioned some and I would add from my perspective, getting it right for every child and the Children and Young People Act, our Play Talk Read campaign, our commitment to high quality early learning and childcare, and our national parenting strategy, the only one in the UK. And what all those policies have in common is that they come from the perspective of prevention and early intervention. And I was pleased the recent State of the Nation report by the UK wide Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission also commended Scotland's Early Years Task Force and the Early Years Collaborative for its continued focus on prevention and early intervention. And I know that the committee had a session uh, taking evidence on the Early Years Collaborative in particular. Now, the Early Years Collaborative is a vehicle and method to deliver our evidence-based policies with the overall ambition to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up by reducing inequalities and giving every child the very best start in life. It empowers practitioners and those working on the front line to use their expertise to test different approaches for different children and families, initially on a very small scale, and then to scale it up. Is the venue difficult for some families? Is the form too complicated for someone who can't read very well? Are we making assumptions about our services meeting people's needs? These are all the questions we're encouraging practitioners to ask when they approach their job. And it's also about co-production, building on the assets that are available in families and communities, working with parents and children. And we're proud that the Early Years Collaborative is also world leading. We are the first to use this methodology in a complex multi-agency environment. And there is a regular flow of requests from around the world to come and visit or to have further information about what we're doing here in Scotland. But far more important is the fact that we are now beginning to see the small tests of change bearing fruit and delivering for children and families. We have the site that has increased breastfeeding rates amongst vulnerable mothers to 86%, albeit though it's a small group, when the local average though is, according to ISD, 25.5%. There are sites that are working to reduce the time it takes to place a child in a permanent care setting. 
There's also a site encouraging parents to read a bedtime story to their children, which started with two parents in one nursery and is now working with 150 parents across six nurseries. The staff continuously evaluate the effectiveness of the interventions and have witnessed outcomes exceeding their expectations, including increased numbers of parents sharing books at bedtime with their children. In one setting alone, parents have read 148 books to their children in the past year. Improved children's speech and language, needing less support in class. Establishing bedtime routines, which has resulted in better behaviour in their classes. Improved concentration and behaviour, and also improved attachment and bonding between parents and their children. Parents have also reported improvements in their own reading, confidence, their understanding of child development and their essential role in that and their own well-being and self-esteem as they witness how their actions are making a positive difference for their child and for themselves. Other sites are using the model to assess whether they are targeting their resources in the correct place with some surprising results. Of course, we still have progress to make and culture can be slow to change, but I have to say that the enthusiasm and commitment that we see from the 700 practitioners from all across Scotland attending the learning sessions that are held in the SCCC every few months make us feel optimistic that progress is on its way and is continually changing the culture that we have in Scotland. So again, Convener, thank you for allowing us to make these opening statements and look forward to answering the questions that the committee may have. Thank you both for your opening statements. And our first question this morning is from Mike McKenzie. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Ministers. So it's interested that uh, each of you has mentioned that you know, this is uh, early years uh, is an issue that crosses portfolios and that should involve all statutory partners. In that vein, uh, do you welcome the appointment of Sir Harry Burns to the Council of Economic Advisers? And do you feel that that signals a you know, perhaps a greater focus on early years and in health inequalities? I think that's an inspiring choice. Um, much of our work, in fact, all of our work is based on, the, on Equally Well, which I, as a Minister for Schools and Skills from 2007 to 2009, was involved with. And Harry Burns was a key member of that group, and that's where um, I first learned about how uh, early health um, and pre-birth health of the mother can impact um, on children and especially in their early years in terms of having um, regular um, feeding and um, nurturing is so important to the development of children's brains so I think it's an inspiring choice. And likewise, you know, it's a clear signal about wanting to align inequality with efforts to improve the economy as well and keeping those closely interlinked. Um, from, from my perspective, Harry Burns has been instrumental in the development of the Early Years Collaborative in his time as the uh, Chief Medical Officer was one of the co-chairs of the Early Years Task Force. So he has been an Early Years Evangelist uh, for some time, making the case around the the country and beyond about the importance of effective intervention in the early years, about brain development and the policies that we need to adopt to try and uh, improve upon that. So he has certainly uh, kept his hand in the early years collaborative and has brought about uh, some of the, the, the changes that, that we're seeking to, to, to make because of that approach. So I think it's um, a, good, a good move that links government much more firmly uh, across social policy and economic policy. Thank you. And just uh, following up on that point, at the committee's session last week, we took evidence from a number of witnesses who commented that some of the early years pilots are a bit short-lived um, and that perhaps don't collect uh, a, a kind of data, an evidence-based understanding of their effectiveness of these pilots. Do you feel that you know, Har Harry Burns' uh, appointment um, will help uh, to make sure that um, we we'll have a, an evidence-based uh, and data-gathering element so that we can really understand where the best and most effective interventions are. I think that's... Do you want to go for well, yeah, I was just going to again mention the, the, the Earlier's Collaborative in, in particular, which is, is very much focused on data collection to ensure that we have the knowledge and um, the confidence to scale up interventions and 
you know, it wasn't designed to be a, a short-term pilot and the earlier collaborative approach doesn't fit neatly into an electoral cycle for either Scottish Parliament or for the local authority elections as well. It's, it's about making sure that we're making the right interventions at the right time and it's about being longer than just the short-term uh, pilot uh, approach that you, that you describe, although pilots have their uses and their uh, importance as well. But certainly the, 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 the thrust for the earlier collaborative is about collecting the data, making sure it's robust, making sure that what you do is working. If you don't get the outcomes that you're expecting, then it's about having the confidence also to use that as a learning opportunity and to, ta uh, to, 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 to not uh, continue beyond with that, with that approach. So this is about bringing about change and doing it with the data that, that is uh, necessary to make sure that we have the, the improvements that we're all seeking. So I think the earlier collaborative approach is, is certainly one that, that um, fulfills some of the, the, the points that you raised within your question. Thank you. I think um, you, know, you highlight a, a problem when you do pilots and people get upset if, pilots, if they think pilots have been working and you stop them. Um, because evaluation has shown that they haven't really um, delivered on what was expected in the first place. Um, I think that's been a problem across um, governments. Um, so it is important that built into the pilot is evaluation. Um, you know, it might be in-house where feasible. It might be uh, others taking, um, you know, thirds, <coughs> the universities, for example, undertaking uh, self-evaluation. So I think all the time we're trying to improve on the methodology um, to make sure that we are getting the right data and finding out if, um, you know, pilots work. Um, and also in terms of um, all the, the, um, the people who come to uh, the sessions that we run across the country um, every now and again, people from there share data and share experiences, and that's all very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Richard uh, Simpson. Yes, I think just taking, going a little further with that particular point on, on research, I wonder if the chief scientist is, is consulted on all these pilots to determine what the baseline database should be before they start, and whether the evaluations, which I think over both administrations have tended to be more process-driven and self-evaluation, rather than outcome driven, uh, whether you know, other outcomes should be looked at carefully. Um, so on the family nurse partnership, we know that the outcomes may well be very long term. And you know, that's, that's, I, I think everyone's signed up to that and recognizing it, but you know, it would be good to have a list of the intermediate outcomes on the projects, on all projects at the beginning. Um, on family nurse partnership, um, it is an expensive program, but it is one that I think this committee has been generally very supportive of uh, and continues to be supportive of. But I have a couple of questions about that. One is the, the fact that they, there are, when someone drops out from the program, uh, they, are not, they are not replaced. And the workload is already fairly generous. I mean, it's a, it's a heavy workload with a small number of families for each practitioner, uh, which is seen by other health visitors as being fairly generous, I think, let's put it just as mildly as that. So when people drop out, uh, you know, the, they're being told, oh, well, we can't replace them because the protocol doesn't allow it or because they might come back. So you can end up with maybe a dropout rate of 10, 15, 20 percent, and, and then the, the workload goes down. So it's something I wonder if the ministers uh, would comment on. And also on the fact that they the families just beyond that who are not eligible for what is a very strict protocol, um, how, you know, how are we supporting um, organisations like that in Fife, which did have a programme for families, uh, including the ones that are now FNP for families, uh, but are under considerable financial pressure. So if you present after 28 weeks, for example, you will not get into the FNP programme. If you're over 21, but are very vulnerable. You will not get into the FNP program. If you have a second child, which must be one of the outcomes delaying that, but if you have a second child, you don't get back into the FNP program. So there's just three examples of people where, you know, how are we actually concentrating on them as well? So that's my first question. I've, I've then a very short one, if I may, Convener. So there's a couple of questions in there, so, uh, you know, but, but important nonetheless in terms of some of the evidence that we've heard. Um, yeah, I, I get, and I 
I agree that the family nurse partnership is, is very impressive and I've been to visit them, no doubt many of you, I think, did you, did you suggest that the committee had been out to visit some of the, uh, the health boards that are further down the line with uh, implementing it and I, and I think some of the indicators are for the kind of, the, in the short term are things like delayed, delays before you have your next child, more confidence when you have your child about the approaches that you want to, to take and the, the attachment and the bonding that can go on there uh, as well. And not least as well, just generally more confidence from the, the, from the mothers and the fathers. Some of the um, examples that I've gone to see in, in, in Fife uh, in particular, I was quite impressed with the numbers of fathers who were being more supportive around, around the family uh, as well. In terms of someone dropping out and not being replaced, um, I, I don't know whether um, Carolyn might want to comment on, on that. I, mean, I know it's quite a strict um, um, a, approach and it has to kind of uh, adhere to the, the rules uh, that are there. Um, but we also have the parenting strategy as well, which was the first in the UK, the first for Scotland to have a national parenting <coughs> strategy which is, speaks to all parents as well, beyond those who you're, you're describing that are eligible to, to go on to the, the Family Nurse Partnership scheme. Um, so we want to make sure that we're helping and supporting parents beyond uh, those, those groups. We have a number of interventions that we have um, endorsed as well through the Earlier Task Force, the uh, Triple P, Incredible Years, on top of the um, Family Nurse Partnership approach. But there are a number of organisations, third sector organisations that we support through third sector strategic in, uh, intervention funding or strategic partnerships. For instance, families outside who are supporting families who are affected by imprisonment, um, making sure that we are supporting them to do the very best that they can through effective uh, interventions and making sure that we can, through the collaborative approach, also target families that are in a bit more need through, for instance, empowering health visitors and midwives to know where to direct families to money matter services uh, to increase their household budgets or to give that support around nurture uh, attachment. Bedtime stories is a, is a perfect. There are now more children getting read a bedtime story as a result of the collaborative approach than ever before, which is a good, you know, on the face of it might sound not the kind of weightiness of politics that we're used to, but certainly in terms of that child's development are and crucial in terms of the long-term outcomes to flourish as an individual. But Caroline, I don't know if you want to comment on the specifics around the Family Nurse Partnership. Yes, yeah, um, yeah um, certainly in, in terms of what you've described, um, Dr Simpson, in terms of replacing the caseloads, it, it depends on where they are in the cycle of um, starting the programme. So um, there, there are opportunities to recruit to empty spaces on caseloads over time. It just depends how far in the cycle um, the teams are in terms of delivering the programme. So we can provide a lot more detail on that and we don't want to go into every single scenario no, no. around that. But you're, you're right, you know, initially there, there can be lower caseloads than anticipated because people may drop out. But but just on that, the, the number of people who actually do um, drop out of the programme is very small. I mean, it's, it's, it's less than um, about 10% overall for the whole programme. So it's very, very small. So you're right, there are some, but, but it's a lot smaller than, than perhaps in other programmes. And in terms of an evaluation strategy that is being uh, developed and will be implemented in 2015, and we're also conscious of what's happening in England in the randomised control trial and family and nurse partnerships um, there, uh, where they were primarily investigating, I think, birth weight, um, smoking during pregnancy, um, and child emergency hospital admissions uh, within two years of being on the programme, um, and, and the proportion of subsequent pregnancies, um, which you mentioned. So uh, that and a number of secondary outcomes will be evaluated during the programme. Very good to get a list of those when they're available. Another small question. Oh, I have another. I was going to say, there's another useful thing to point to is the Grown Up in Scotland report as well, which has, you know, that's that longitudinal study as well, which can give us some very rich information yes. as well. So there are other areas in which we can point to Great for some more kind of baseline data as well that uh, Mr Simpson's interested in. My, my other question is on a quite different area. I don't know if anyone wants to come in on That's that. That's good. We've got, we've got a number of people wanting to ask questions, Richard. So there'll be an opportunity at the, the end of that one if people... Yep. Bob, Doris. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I was interested to know how ongoing government policies 
will fit in with the newly announced independent advisor in poverty and inequality that the, that the, that the Scottish Government has indicated that they, they wish to appoint. So, for example, we've got some ongoing programmes such as the Family Nurse Partnerships uh, and the National Parenting Strategy. We've got some new initiatives announced such as uh, a new literacy and numeracy drive in P1 to P3 attainment officers in each local authority fitting together uh, in terms of an early year strategy. Um, I would kind of like to know where you see the role of the independent advisor in poverty and inequality. Um, do you see it as one that would challenge government when perhaps they haven't got it quite right or suggest changes in ways to progress policies forward? Because we've got a, we've got a variety of strategies out there. This committee is supportive of many of them. And I think what we're looking for is an independent expert to see the thread that runs through all of the, of the policies and endorse when the government's got it right and, and to, to point them when they have to redirect it. This committee will, of course, scrutinise each individual initiative, but I'm just keen to know where you see this independent advisor on poverty and inequality fitting into the early years uh, framework. Um, I, I, would, I would think that the, while they're currently developing the, the, the role and remit of the, the poverty advisor, that it would be absolutely right and proper for that person to challenge government, and that's where there is most use for uh, people in appointments like that. For instance, as well, um, we also have the Ministerial Advisory Group on uh, Child Poverty as well, which um, the now First Minister, now uh, former Deputy First Minister, used to chair alongside uh, Margaret Burgess and I used to attend as well. And that, 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 that forum there allowed us to be challenged about the policies that we were wanting to take forward and making sure that we had... Uh, brought to bear the, the expertise from beyond uh, the parliament, beyond government uh, and from the wider uh, civic society as well to make sure that we're tackling uh, inequality and child poverty in particular. In my own uh, portfolio uh, as well, more directly, we've got the Early Years Task Force and one of the most recent appointments who has just recently agreed to uh, take a, a role within the Early Years Task Force is Professor Jim McCormick from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation uh, as well. So I think there is a signal there across government, across portfolios, across different uh, disciplines that we're wanting to make sure that there's common commonality there about making sure that we are challenged and that those challenges are robust because I know from my own experience in the task force that when you have people together likes of um, the Children's Commissioner, John Carnahan uh, and I know now with the appointment of Jim McCormick that the, the challenge that you get there is what makes sure that you're approaching your policies in a robust way and that they're doing the things that you're wanting to do uh, and so um, we I would absolutely welcome the appointment of a poverty advisor and would hope that they are robust in their challenge because we can't afford to have rose-tinted glasses um, and nice conversations. We have to, this is a real problem affecting families now, so we need to make sure that we're getting that challenge and that that challenge is as strong as it can be to direct us into the correct areas of focus. I mean, I mean constructively, of, of course, but yeah, I'm just interested to know which, what priority this independent advisor, I mean, if it's independent, they will set their own priorities, but I would be keen for them to, to perhaps start in early years, given that the Scottish Government's theme has been early intervention in early years um, mm -hmm. for, 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 for a number of years now. I'm also interested to know, Convener, in terms of, and perhaps you can't answer this, but you could feed it in, in, into government. I mean, the childcare was going to be my follow-up question in relation to um, the, this independent advisor on poverty and inequality, because we've got a increasingly qualified early years workforce. Uh, I have to say the pay they get, the remuneration they get doesn't particularly reflect um, their skill set now. So we've quite often got a, a low paid workforce. Uh, we've got a huge expansion of provision plan by the Scottish Government running right through to 2020. Uh, but w we need to make sure the child care is in the right place, in the right setting, not just for the child, but for the parents who are in work and are hoping to get into work. So there's a relationship with, say, partnership nurseries there as well. And, of course, there's a, a UK layer to this with the tax credit system, for example, needing to, to support people into work or the minimum wage or living wage having to be at a, a correct level. Would you see your role or the role of working with an independent advisor on poverty and inequality working across different governments in terms of uh, looking at the bigger picture, because if they only look at Scottish Government policies, it's going to miss a trick, because it's much more complicated than that. Well, I, 
think I think there's a lot of merit in what you say, and I'm sure that once and and I, and I would not want to second guess the remit, but I would certainly to be helpful to the committee as well suggest that we make sure that once that's um, finalised, that we make sure that you're kept up to speed with what that role and remit would look like. But I think what you're saying is um, has has considerable merit in terms of childcare. Um, again, these things we can keep the committee informed. We've commissioned Professor Siraj. Um, who's an academic with a speciality in childcare to, to look at the workforce. Because you're right, we have an increased, um, increased um, knowledgeable uh, workforce who have got um, qualifications now in a way that they didn't before. Because one of the drivers alongside the economic reasons uh, to, do, to, to, to make uh, increases to, and expand childcare is around the quality. Because if we want to have the outcomes that we expect for children, then that needs to be a good quality setting for those children. Otherwise, uh, the effectiveness isn't uh, going to um, flourish beyond just that those 600 hours. So, Professor Siraj is, is doing uh, research on the workforce and what more we need to do as a government to help with that quality and to look at things like um, the feminisation of, of the workforce, how do we look at pay uh, and a whole host of other things and she's due to uh, report back to us in the spring of next year so we'll make sure that you're kept abreast of that. The 600 hours uh, and the partnership um, issue that you touched upon as well. We have a mixed bag of different providers it's not just um, local authorities that provide the statutory entitlement, it's private sector and third sector uh, childminders uh, as well so we have a mixed economy there and the reason for taking the first step towards the 600 hours expansion was to try and increase that flexibility because we know that families need flexibility, they need um, to be able to access that childcare uh, and they need quality childcare uh, as well. So we're not there yet, but the Act implemented an expansion that was the first step towards that transformational change that we're seeking. Now, you know, I guess it's frustrating, frustrating that tax credits aren't something that we have um, competency over because there is very much interlinked uh, with childcare uh, and, her, and the funding of, of childcare. But we are embarking upon a change that will, we hope, deliver for families and develop, deliver for parents and deliver, importantly, for children uh, as well. And the first step towards that was the expansion that we announced through the Children and Young People Act uh, earlier this year. Kavina, thank you. I, I won't have any more questions, but fair to say you might think you're sitting at an education committee rather than a health committee with those questions, but we're quite clear as a committee, and we have been for some time, that the, the early years is so important in terms of uh, lifelong health outcomes and getting it right at the most very early years, including childcare and employability of the parents and good quality uh, um, parenting and, and, uh, and, and what place experiences for families are, are, crit are critical, so thank you very much. And that's why the two-year-old expansion as well is critical, that the quality is there as well, because you know, we need to make sure that those children who are very, very young are getting the best start in life and that the quality is essential as well as the kind of economic, the very sound economic reasons uh, for doing uh, and expanding uh, childcare. Uh, but I would just say, uh, within my portfolio as early years, as, as Minister for Children and Young People, that effective intervention and early intervention isn't the same as early years as well, and that you can effectively intervene in a child's life beyond the early years as well. And I just would—I know that you're, you're concentrating on early years, but I, I just would just raise that as, a, as an issue as well, because we don't want to write off children uh, just because they're beyond the age of eight. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Minister. My, it might, it might be the journey through. But my head's in a, you know, a spin with the, the, the amount of initiative projects groups, <coughs> experts, whatever. There's a comfort in that because that's what we've heard in evidence throughout this committee. And indeed, Bob, in our last role um, uh, in the Local Government and Communities Committee, um, how do we make sense of it all? We all enjoy these moments on a Monday and a Friday about looking at good projects, come away feeling great. But the stark figures that we have on breastfeeding in certain groups, smoking, drugs, alcohol consumption, when well pregnant, are, are, are improving, getting better, static. Where, you know, where, where are the indicators? Single outcome agreements. What have we learned from them? How many local authorities put child poverty as a priority in those, on those single outcome agreements? 
I think you, uh, convener, and Bob Doris make um, very valid points, and I think this is going to come more to the fore as budgets are challenged, and we've got to make sure um, that people are not duplicating work um, and that the best practice is rolled out um, across local authorities. So, as you say, we can all visit um, good projects in particular local authority areas, um, but we need to make sure that where that is proven to work, it is rolled out uh, in other areas and that we are making the best use of the workforce there and not duplicating and not um, you know, perhaps misusing um, resources. And I think um, that is happening um, through, as I say, the, um, the coming together of all the, the lead people in, um, these, um, uh, in, in, in these projects um, through the Early Years Collaborative. Um, and we are seeing good practice being rolled out. And you know, the, the, the leaders who come to these meetings are very keen to make sure that they learn from others and, and roll out best practice. Um, the, the legislation that we passed earlier this year, the Children and Young People Act, was seeking to embed that consistency that I think we're, we're needing. So we had 32 different levels of uh, progress across Scotland about how far uh, the local authorities were in, in terms of implementing getting it right for every child. You know, we all understand that the Highlands model was furthest along through the, the Pathfinder. This was something, I think, you know, one of the most recent uh, members' debates that uh, Dr Sipson took part in as well, that we realised was an approach that went beyond uh, party politics as well. It has been, had started with the Labour administration and it's been continued because it's been uh, the right thing to do uh, by ourselves in government. But it has lacked that national consistency, which is why we drove it forward with the legislation that we passed in, uh, in, in the spring of the year. And the reason I mention that is because of the, the wellbeing indicators, which now in, have, for example, uh, include, included, do children feel included? And that's been one of the discussions of topics that we've had through the Child Poverty Action Group about how we make that meaningful in terms of children who are facing deprivation and issues uh, around um, Poverty. So there is method in terms of driving forward with the legislation about linking that into the groups that we're talking around, whether that's the Child Poverty Action Group, uh, the Child sorry, Ministerial Working Group, the Early Years Task Force uh, as well. And it's important to note that the Child the Poverty Strategy also now includes an outcomes framework to give more robust uh, indicators about how we're making progress along those issues that you have um, questioned and wanted some Mr. assurance I mean, on. I understand, Minister, both Ministers, that you know, we, we deal with some of this frustration and we take the evidence over, over years on mm -hmm. some of these issues and, and, and across politics and across government. Mm -hmm. But and I mentioned the single outcome agreements because they've been in place for some considerable time, mm -hmm. whereas there are family and partnerships you know, would need to be evaluated further down the line. Mm -hmm. But given the importance of local, local government in delivering lots of these policy uh, mm -hmm. initiatives on the ground, what does the single outcome agreement show us at this point some, what, seven years in? What does it show us? And where are the lessons? Or, or, or do, do we not know? Well, all local authorities have single outcome agreements that are committed to reducing inequalities. In the opening statement that Maureen made, we were making inroads and we were making uh, progress uh, right. along, along the way, and we have ways in which we uh, can keep um, monitoring that, but there is a, a realisation that we need to do to do more and always need to do more as well. And that's why, you know, the child poverty strategy now has an outcomes framework as well so that we can not just have the strategy and launch that and that's all great, but we have a, an effective mm. way of monitoring the progress. And again, that points to the way in which we're, we're working through the, with the early years collaborative, which is about effective data collection yeah, yeah, in a way that I think you describe has, has been, has been uh, maybe not there in the past to make sure that we have the confidence to approach policies that are do, do, delivering do, the results we no, require. I'm not, I'm not questioning no, the, no, about, the ambition of Scottish Government or uh -huh. indeed Scottish Governments over the piece. I'm not questioning that at all. I'm questioning there is policy coming out of our ears. There are experts and groups and discussion groups coming out. What 
you know, if we look at the single outcome agreements, what difference has that made to the most vulnerable children in Scotland? Well, the, like I say, you know, they all have a focus. All, thing, all local authorities have a focus on inequalities. And of all committed through the task force, all committed through the Earliers Collaborative to have the focus to, to, to tackle child poverty, to tackle inequality, yeah. and to make sure that they're making progress. And we have ways in which we monitor. So for instance, the task force were required, we have to do a sweep to make sure that they're, you know, they are approaching that change agenda in a way that we would oh. expect, given the money that they've put up to try and change the way that they have we focused. Know, we know, Minister, and you pointed out to us, uh -huh. and I, don't, I, I think it is very important, important about that mm -hmm. connection with children and parents, about reading a book. It's more than just reading a book. But you could tell us 700 children were now reading a book with their parents. Mm -hmm. you know, I think we're just asking for some you know, indication through the single outcome again so it's been in place for, the, you know, for a considerable time have we got some you know we set up that policy with some ambition to make lives different for most of the most vulnerable people in Scotland mm -hmm. what, was a, what was a starting point I mean I'm looking at officials or whatever that, you know, that, what was a starting point and an ambition at that point have we made progress uh, you know, in, in addressing some of the issues that we uh, we, we developed a, the, the policy to, to, to bring about, well, and what, what are the improvements uh, that, that have been made? Well, we can identify child poverty rates have come down since devolution, and child poverty rates have, have come down considerably. So there's a clear indication that... As that, a result of the single outcome agreements, as a result of the government policy. That's what we're trying to... Start. But there's a mix... There's a mixture. There's a mixture there. There's a mixture of policies and different approaches because you can't have the same approach across 32 local authorities. I don't think you can uh, leave it at the door uh, or lay it solely at the door of local authorities. For example, uh, NHS boards have local delivery plans, uh, and this is being more linked up now to the community planning partnerships. And you know, with health and social care integration, we think, tend to think of that in terms of older people, but it's also going to be rolled out in terms of, of younger people as well. So I don't think you can lay it solely at the door of local authorities because it is an integrated pr approach um, with health as well. I, 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 I'm not tempted to blame anybody. I mean, we, we, in health, at least we've got a list in health, and I think that's the, 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 the challenge that maybe other government departments have. And in, in health, whether the indicators are correct or not, we have they, they are there, and we use them to indicate whether we're making progress. And that's birth weight, smoking prevalence, and mortality, whatever, whatever, whatever. And we can measure that up and down. I'm, I'm just looking for other types of measurement that, that, that I thought that would be available to us as a committee this morning mm -hmm. to I say, well, they're, 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 they're the challenges are there. I see Dr. Millen. Yeah, Dr. Maybe trying. I mean, you're yes. right. We, we've got the, the indicators that we use to um, identify progress on tackling health inequalities. Yes. And they're just a, a handful of hundreds of indicators we could have used. But they are not, they're not specifically applicable to what the NHS is doing. They're actually what we are doing across all organisations to contribute to actually shifting those indicators. Those indicators, unfortunately, are not going to change rapidly because whilst we've maybe broken them down into short, intermediate or long-term indicators, you don't get quick results. No. So and I think going back to the point about what are the, what's the SOAs doing, what's, what difference is that making? Well, I think um, it's actually getting people together to talk about these things in a partnership to actually uh, to think about how they're doing things more coherently than they maybe have done in the past. And it, when Equally Well was first published in 2008, it set out quite clearly that the CPPs were going to be critical in actually delivering on this. But if you think about it, CPPs haven't maybe found their feet in that, in that respect up until maybe the, the Christie report. And from that point on, they've started to work, I think more clearly about what it is they have to do, how they work in partnership. And we've actually, the government's been quite specific in terms of identifying priorities that we want to see reflected in the SOAs. And, and, and the minister's absolutely right. Health boards have their own LDPs as well. And it's only in the last two or three years we've asked them to specifically say, what are you doing to contribute to the SOA? How is this all merging together? So it's actually taking what is an enormously complex area with enormously complex organisations and asking them to, to try and work together. And it, it is a bit of a process, I think. Um, and one of the, some of the things you want to see is, are they actually 
giving you a, a sense of confidence that they're actually beginning to think about how they uh, talk about this, create the structures amongst themselves to actually deliver on this. Uh, and, and to a certain extent, you're getting some of those, uh, that sense of confidence in a variety of areas. And you see some of the work they've done around health and social care integration, which is maybe not, uh, it, it, it does show that they can work together. It's difficult, and all these things are difficult, but I think you get a, a sense of this progress there and they're working towards the priorities that the government have agreed they should do. The jury's still out. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I, th I think the, to, uh, you're, you're trying to shift the way or complex organisations do business and, and engage with each other. And bear in mind, the CPP is not just the health boards and local authorities, it's the police. It's, and they've all got an important role to play. And that's being reflected back within government as well as how officials actually work across their policy areas to, uh, to, to try and identify opportunities to work synergistically not just in, in name, but actually really try and work with our colleagues to, to, to join these things up. And, and it's, it's a huge challenge. It's an enormously complex process. And it's a huge challenge. But I think we are making progress on that. I'm going to move on to uh, Rhoda Grant. Thanks, Convener. Um, I guess on the same type of theme that um, Duncan mcneil has been questioning on, but maybe an easier one to answer, in what tests do government carry out when they're developing policies to deal with health inequalities indeed in the early years. So if you're developing, we know that this is cross-cutting, it's not health, it's not education, it goes across all departments. So when new policies are being developed, what tests are put in place to see how they impact on health inequalities, especially in the early years? Um, well, you know, in, in similar fashion to the response I gave to, to Bob Doris, we have a number of different um, relationships with different uh, key professionals, stakeholders, organisations, third sector, who we don't make go we don't make government policy in, in isolation. You know, we have to make sure that what we're doing will have the impacts that we uh, expect for the child, and that the outcomes will will be there. So we have the earlier task force, which is a key kind of um, collaboration of, 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 of effort from across the third sector, the private sector, health. Um, local authorities and others who are inputting into the things that we need to do as a government. The Ministerial <coughs> Advisory Group on Child Poverty as well as cross-cutting. Um, as who, well, Who sits uh, in that? Who sits in the child poverty? Well, there's um, Jim McCormick, who, uh, who's already agreed to um, be part of the, the earlier task force. There is representation from CPAG, um, John Dickey. Uh, there are. Oh, I'm struggling to remember all the names, but there are. Um, yes. Alec, can you remember? The so, so the, the other people on that group are from Bernardo's, Bernardo's. from One Parent Family Scotland. We have the Scottish Commissioner from the UK Social Mobility and Child Poverty mm -hmm. Commission. We have Linda De Gastica, who's from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and Jane Wood from Scottish Business in the, the Community. community. Oh. On that group. And Jane Wood now sits on the earlier task force as well to uh, make sure that we're bringing to bear all the, the expertise that we have. And of course, there are other opportunities as well. You know, for instance, the parenting strategy that we took forward was used was developed in consultation with parents, but engaging those parents through the organisations such as Children First, Families Outside, all those different organisations who already have networks of contact with parents to make sure that what we are doing as a government is what parents tell us that they require. So it's never done in isolation. And that's why, again, you know, pointed to the collaborative, that these approaches are are not just about government, they're about bringing together all the players that have an input and a direct influence in the uh, success of the policies that we want to take forward. So how do they interact with government when developing policies on, um, say, the budget, say, on, on um, the environment, on all those issues that impact on, on poverty? Well, again, you know, it's about making sure that we have that, that discipline of government that we are cross-cutting. Like I said in my opening statement, we could have asked a number of different um, ministers to come here to, to, to talk about tackling inequalities. So we have, um, you know, we have, like I say, I've described some of the, the areas by which we make sure that we've got people coming from all areas and all sectors to influence the policy directions that we, that we take forward.
But how do they, I, I guess I'm looking for the mechanisms of how they do that. Well, I mean, do they sit at the, the cabinet ministerial table? Ministerial Working Group on Child Poverty, the Earlier Task Force, there's Raising Attainment for All, which is a collaborative beyond the early years that's looking towards raising attainment. There are key players that sit on that in a national sense and also in a very local sense uh, as well. There are a number of initiatives that aren't just about government officials and government ministers sitting on deciding how to take forward policy. Again, you know, I'm just reiterating the point that these are bringing together people who have key expertise in areas and influence in areas that we think we need to have a, a sharper focus on. But how do they influence other areas, I think, is what I'm trying to drive oh, at. OK, we'll ask. Can I just maybe bring... Uh, uh, there's a particular bit of work we do around... Well, obviously, a lot of policies are put through the or equality as impact assessment. But we also have something called the Health Inequalities Impact Assessment, which has been ongoing since about 2010. NHS Health Scotland carry these out. Uh, and I, I don't have the briefing in front of me. They have, they've, they've done about 30 since then. And they put out guidance in about 2011 about um, uh, health inequalities impact assessment. So they take particular policies and they will do a health inequalities impact assessment of them to try and ensure that the policy that's being taken forward has taken into account a, a range of things that impact on people's inequalities. I don't have the detail here with me. Uh, around that, but that's a specific way of actually looking at a, a new policy initiative to determine what impact it's likely to have. It might be that after you've determined the impact, you still are going to go ahead, but at least you know, uh, or it might help you actually influence what you do to actually make it uh, have less of a negative impact. Does that happen on all policy development? It, it, uh, it's, it's, it, it's done about 30 in the last, uh, since 2010. I'm just trying to remember, the, I've, there's a list uh, on Health Scotland's website and it looks like there's about 30, 30 plus. They, they do, they've done about um, five or six this year. Uh, so they, they pick, I don't know what, if it's just capacity or how they do it, but it won't, it won't be everyone, but it'll be certain ones they've done. And they've done a lot in, um, in NHS and some within the Scottish Government. Okay. There are a couple of um, publications. There's the Long-Term Monitoring of Health Inequalities, which was published in October of this year. Um, it does show that the progress is being made, but um, absolute inequality still uh, persists in some areas. And then Audit Scotland had a report, health inequalities in Scotland. Um, so there are a number of publications which influence and will, will um, determine Scottish Government policy as we go forward. And following the Children's um, children and Young People Bill as well, we're developing a child's rights impact assessment tool as well to ensure that we make good on the pledge that we set out in that and that all areas of policy beyond just education, social work and health have, have rec recognised their role in terms of delivering uh, better, um, delivering more for children in terms of their rights. Okay, but that ha isn't going on at the moment, and, and that's what I'm. Well, that's part that. of the what new legislation. That was why that that was that's that's following the new legislation that we passed just fairly recently. And that will focus on on childhood inequalities. Well, I was just adding to complement the other kind of areas of uh, areas of influence that other parts of the, the government will have in terms of inequalities. That this child's rights impact assessment, which you know, child's right, you know, children have inalienable rights as children, which include being able to participate in society so that would have an impact on on the question that you asked i thought I, you know i can be i can let you know how that develops further down the line I, i'm just I, I get the impression that health social work education all kind of look at this but we all know it goes much much wider than Absolutely. that and at the yeah. moment we we at the moment we seem only to look at that very narrow field which deals with the symptoms not the causes and i'm wondering what tests are carried out on all government policy to make sure that the causes are being dealt with, not just the symptoms. Well, and also in addition to the, the, the child's rights element of the Children and Young People Act as well, getting it right for every child requires a broader approach to ensuring that we are getting it right for each and every child, which that's requiring of local authorities and, and health and, and other uh, partners to make sure that everyone is doing what they can. And that goes beyond um, housing, social work, education. So that's why we're about to go to consultation on the guidance that will accompany the legislation on that and making sure that local authorities uh, do recognise the role that they all have to um, uh, make sure that we are getting it right for, for every child across the country and to make good on the legislation and the legislative changes that we've just uh, taken forward. Um, 
So that's one way in which we'll be able to make sure that the influence it may, is beyond it may be, it may health be useful and education. If, you know, because I think the, there's much to, uh, the, 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 that's going on has been described by the ministers and the, indeed the officials earlier about how the government attempt to tackle these these issues. Because you know, I, I, I think the committee are, are looking at, at um, you're looking at health and, and, and the, you know, the indicators there, but don't see that reflected in some other areas. But I, I think I hear from Dr Miller and ministers that there are genuine attempts to be starting that work and are pushing on that work. And I think, that, I think that's positive. And maybe if the committee could hear more about that, I think that would be, that would be useful. I mean, I think um, you know, the wider point, uh, you know, there was a recent paper from... Um, uh, from uh, uh, David, the, the professor that was here, giving us evidence, um, along with on the economic side, the budget. David Bell made the point, um, you know, in a recent paper, that uh, government policy, almost like the inverse care policy, government making policy that that unintentionally can may, may, may not, not be of help, if, if, if I put it that way, in less pejorative terms, that, uh, of um, uh, climate change targets that actually put up fuel bills for the poorest. Or put our budget. You know, so we're looking for information like that, that the, 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 the government are taking some of these yeah. issues on. And it seems, it seems to be that they are starting that process. And that's, that's a good thing. That's what we'd like to hear. But we'd probably, rather than labour it and go on like I'm doing this morning, we'd get, back to get you some and list, information. Uh, I'll list you that, but in addition to, the, to, to what we've all said as well, there is a, the, the First Minister announced in our programme for government that there is to be a poverty impact assessment to be introduced as well. So... All of these things can be tied, tied together to give you a broader sense of how we're knitting together the, the actions of, of government to ensure that we're not working in silos, yes. but everything is pointing yes. towards driving forwards in terms of making improvements to our economy, but, but also making uh, inroads into tackling inequality as well. I, so I, I think, th that I think that's where the committee is after hearing the, the evidence we are. We want, we want to hear, hear more about that and we want to encourage that sort of activity, I think. Is, is, is what, you know, it's how government has operated for a long time, not just you know, the government uh, at this point. Um, uh, I need to push on. I've got Graeme, uh, Graeme Day, please, Graeme. Okay, uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to the Ministers. I, I want to look at an aspect of delivery of support. Uh, I wonder if the Minister for Public Health can update uh, us on the progress being made with the deployment of the uh, additional 500 health visitors over the next four years. I think it was announced six months ago. And can she um, confirm that these will be operating across rural as well as urban areas? And I ask that as a, an MSP for a, a rural area that, that's not seen as having a significant deprivation issue, and yet the existing health visitors are having to deliver classes and basic parenting skills for young people. Uh, so, so I wonder to what extent the Minister would accept the need to ensure there's appropriate geographical deployment of the new health visitors, taking account of areas certainly more rural than the one that I represent, in order to ensure that um, there's a support there for all families across Scotland that uh, are requiring that support. Um, yeah, I think you make a, a, a very valid point. Um, and um, the Scottish Government announced in June of this year uh, that they'd be providing funding uh, two million in this year, with a total of 41.6 million over the next few years for additional health visitors, with the goal to grow the workforce uh, by 500 by 2018. And this is to ensure that funding uh, helps all health boards to ensure that there are enough health visitors to provide universal visits uh, and development checks for children, um, such as the 27 to, to 30 months review, um, and to meet the obligations under the Children and Young People Scotland Act to provide uh, the named person. So that extra uh, money is going in, and since 2007, health visitor numbers have increased um, by about 22%. Um, but um, w we are committed to making sure that that is covering all health boards, and I think it's up to the health boards themselves to make sure, um, because there is a tendency to think that inequalities exist in particular 
uh, pockets in our society, but we've got to make sure um, that individuals who live in poverty, particularly in rural areas, have access to services as well. Let me follow up on that. Camille. I, I, I welcome that commitment, but how, how will the government ensure that that takes place across the health boards? Because there is perhaps a risk that health boards take these additional resources and, for want of a better expression, target the easiest uh, uh, target. So you, know, you would focus them in, in major cities where you would appear to get the best return. I, I mean, there, there are obvious challenges in particular rural areas, the bigger ones, in how you deploy those resources effectively. I mean, what sort of guidance will be given to health boards to ensure that, that we get this right? I'm going to refer to my notes here, but um, the, uh, we have recommended that NHS boards use a validated caseload working tool to support consistency in determining health visitor numbers across Scotland. And this tool is based on population data and allows for local variation. And, and that would be used in conjunction with nursery and nursing and midwifery workforce workload planning tools. Okay. It sounds technical, but I think it, it explains but, what but it But it's something you're mindful of, obviously. <laughs> yes. Um, just, Nanette Millen wants to ask a series of questions on a similar uh, subject. And, uh, it would just be very brief. It was just to, to, to pinpoint, and, and I can follow that up, but there is a specific example of a collaborative test pioneer site in Angus about tackling and supporting parents in those early years around substance misuse as well. So I think you know that would give some comfort that there is that focus there on when not just the urban areas, but local authorities are taken very seriously and health boards are taken very seriously, the, the impact of rurality and other areas that they have uh, to, to help uh, parents. And I can pass you information about the, uh, the improved attachment and child development um, that work that's going on in Angus. And also Angus have got quite a good um, case to make around their approach to getting it right for every child uh, as a local authority in general. Just to kind of follow on from there, I mean, I very much welcome the, the extra 500 promised uh, health visitors because I think, I think they play an absolutely crucial role, not just in early years, but as children develop and, and in, but just with picking out families who, who need help. I mean, I'm a great fan, actually, of practice-based in primary care based health visitors because having grown up with it when my husband was in practice they really do have an insight into the, the local families who, who, who are facing difficulties um, I did raise this when, last week when, and the, the deep end practitioner agreed with me she thought this in, in that sort of practice that a practice based health visitor would be really very useful I have to say that Theresa Fife of the RCN indicated things have moved on and she wasn't quite so enthusiastic about that way so I welcome some comments on, on that um, I mean I think some of the most experienced health visitors have gone into family nurse partnerships which where they're doing a tremendous job I'm sure um, and so given that, given the, the sort of named person um, role, um, do you think actually that 500 is going to be enough? I mean, I know, I know it's a lot, at, given their standing point just now, but it's, uh, do you think in the fullness of time that will be enough to, to cover the needs? Because I'm not convinced it will be. Well, obviously, you know, we will continue to monitor it to see uh, whether it is enough or not. But you're absolutely right um, that the health visitor will be, for the majority of children under five, uh, the named person. And um, we've got to make sure um, that there are enough if they are going to be, as in most cases, the, um, the, the named person. But I think Theresa Fife did say that you know, health visitors will make a, a, a crucial, a critical difference uh, to the health and well-being of future lives of children and families. Um, and she does recognise the importance uh, of health vis visitors. And, you know, she welcomed the increase in investment uh, in health visitors. Um, and we've got to make sure um, that that is fully resourced. But... Um, you know, aliens more versed in this in terms of the name person. And I guess as well, I just need to caution because there's currently a, an issue, a legal issue ongoing around the, that particular element of the, the act. However, the name person won't, it's not, it's not that every family will ever need their, their name person as well. So it's important to recognise that um, it's a, a 
important first point of contact. It's an important, uh, well-known practitioner in a, in a family's life with a, an existing relationship, but not every family will need to um, use use their named person either. And also the money that was announced to accompany the uh, increase and expansion of health visitors also was about in, uh, increasing capacity and increasing their training uh, as well and knowledge about some of the, the new kind of requirements around the, the legislation as well. So it's not just about recruitment, it's about making sure that there's, there's the quality behind um, that as well to, uh, to take cognizance of the legislative changes that have taken forward. So, but will this involve uh, increasing recruitment into the nursing profession altogether? Because, I mean, the, 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 clearly they've got to train as nurses before they become health visitors. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if there's enough <coughs> trained nurses ready to go into that role at this point in time. Would you like to... Yeah, I, I mean, certainly the modelling took account of the workforce demographics and... Um, the number of health visitors who would naturally be going through the system and then looked at the, the workforce overall. It, it has been very closely monitored and it is down to the health boards so they can see what resource they need and actually where that resource might be coming from. So it is a four-year cycle, so you can imagine that mm -hmm. you know graduates from nursing degrees will be coming out you know at every year. So the, the hope is that you know that, that will not cause a, you know, a, a gap in other nursing services by um, people moving into health visiting. Um, but it is very clear now that a lot more um, nurses are looking to choose health visiting as a profession, whereas over the past couple of years that's certainly not been uh, you know, as strong. So, so we are, do feel quite positive that we will be able to build um, the commitment that we've, we've made in here. And, and again, you know, it's the, this is embedding the, the GERFEC approach, the name person approach, was about embedding best practice and what already many health visitors, teachers already currently do in terms of the relationships they have with the family and, and, and helping and supporting that family and the parents as well. Uh, the statutory requirement won't be until 2016, so it's not an immediate uh, start, and we're about to consult on the statutory guidance. Uh, that will have to accompany the legislation as well, which will provide another opportunity to reflect and make sure that we have all the all the all the things that require in place. But it, it's not until 2016 that the statute requirement for the name person and the GERFEC element of the Children and Young People Act uh, comes into uh, into force. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm pleased that this is being looked at and monitored very carefully because it's been based on a previous cut in the intake of, of nurse, nursing students. I think it is important to look at the whole thing and plan well ahead so that we have people coming through the system. And I think funding uh, is, is reflecting that in, in the budget lines because funding for new posts will rise um, to 6.8 million in 2015-16, up to 20 million in 17-18. So the money is going in to reflect the need for new posts. I'll let you come back. The Minister actually picked up the fact of the nursing student cut. I mean, I know this was partially restored, but there were cuts of 20%, 10% in each of two years, and it hasn't been fully restored. There's been a cut in the midwifery intake which was 40%, which has only been partially restored, 180 down to 100, back up to 160. And these two cuts have been heavily criticised by the Royal College of Nursing, but they are particularly pertinent in view of the very welcome decision to increase the number of health visitors, because health visitors postgraduate training, you've got to get through the first training first. If the student numbers are not coming through in increased numbers, how are you going to augment the numbers by 500? I just don't follow the logic of this. The, the, the numbers are being reversed so that we are recruiting more and taking the need for health visitors into account. So the full nursing complement that was three years ago before the cuts will be restored. Is that what you're saying? Um, well, I can't give a guarantee that that's the, the, the numbers, but I can get back to you on that. Richard Lyle. Convener, I, most of the questions I was going to ask uh, actually have been, have been answered, but can I turn to the two quick ones, if possible? Uh, child care. Um, the Scottish Government's increased the investment in child care provision, and, and you know most parents are, are, are uh, require, and, and we all know that uh, how, how good it is for the child. What impact do you think that will have on early years 
health equalities. The impact of childcare? Yeah. You. Well, increased provision. Uh -huh. So the increased provision is that it's about making sure that like we have said in, in response to other questions about giving children the best uh, start in life, we have also um, increased the uh, ability of, of the workforce as well through having requirements to have the BA childhood practice and other areas of um, that we're requiring the practitioners to have more more um, qualifications in as well. So the quality is there. That's what we're we're trying to improve the quality to make sure that the children who have got that those 600 hours are getting a quality experience. The expansion into two-year-olds, 15% this year, and 27% next year, uh, as well as about you know taking on board what everyone has been talking about. If you intervene effectively in the early years, that you can improve outcomes in later life. But the two-year-old uh, and the three and four-year-old expansion is also about not just giving support to that child, but making sure that we have uh, proper and building relationships uh, with the families as well, providing that support and those uh, increasing their capacity as well, so that that child's not just getting a nurturing experience in the 600 hours, but there's increased capacity to ensure that that child, when they're going home, is getting the nurture that they require. It's not, it's not the end point. 600 hours will do an awful lot in terms of reducing household budgets. It will... We've, our own modelling has suggested it will be £700 per child per year for families. Well, that's the saving that they'll make. Uh, but it's not the end point. We want to build on that expansion by increasing the flexibility, by increasing the hours further uh, as well. But we need to do that at a pace that allows us to get the, the adequate number of people in place to deliver on, on, those, um, on those targets and to deliver on the quality as well. Uh, I welcome that. My, my grandson is, uh, is now attending uh, nursery. Uh, and the next question I have is actually, my granddaughter is only months old. Recently we had a press report of a lady in a, a, a famous hotel in London uh, being asked to leave her cover-up because of breastfeeding. You covered, you covered the, the point earlier, uh, at the rates of, of breastfeeding in Scotland. Now, we know that there is a law uh, recently passed by this Parliament in regards to breastfeeding. What action is the Scottish Government taking to ensure that firms and the public uh, know that uh, people, ladies, are new mothers, are allowed to breastfeed in public? Mm. I guess it also doesn't help when you've got certain politicians making certain claims as well in public about breastfeeding as well. But I'll leave that for Minister Farage to explain away. But which, I, I which I totally <laughs> deplore. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, like I said, you know, some of the, the, the tests of change from the earlier collaborative point of view have been around increasing the, the prevalence of breastfeeding, providing the support that mums may need. Um, because at that point, you're very vulnerable. You've just had a baby and you're getting bombarded with lots and lots and lots of information as well. And so you're not needing to be kind of made to feel, to feel guilty as well. But actually what we're doing is uh, making sure that the support's there for uh, mothers who need that extra bit of help to uh, increase the, the prevalence of breastfeeding because, you know, the, the, it's the, it offers the best start in life to uh, children. So there are a number of initiatives. The legislation was passed, I think, in 2005 as well. Um, there's a number of initiatives about baby-friendly baby or breastfeeding-friendly uh, status. Um, we have promoting it through a number of uh, different avenues. UNICEF are taking forward a, a number of bits of, of work uh, to get accreditation for places to be baby uh, breastfeeding friendly, uh, Maureen might want to t talk some, some more about some of those, those areas, but certainly the, the collaborative example that I gave you, the, through the result of the work there, it was 85%, I think, 86% um, of the mothers that they're working with are now breastfeeding. Now, that is important to recognise that's a small, a small sample, but I think it points to the fact that if you work effectively with a group of mothers, that you can, uh, in quite quick, quite quickly turn around more positive results than maybe we've seen uh, in, in the past, especially when I think the, the overall results for the Fife was 25% as well. So I think that shows just the difference that you can make with that, um, that, that approach that the collaborative has, has brought to bear in, in Fife. So I think it's incredibly important, not least as well because I'm about to have a child myself, but um, yeah, we have a culture in Scotland that um, appreciates the, the benefits and recognises how, how important it is for mothers to feel um, that there's a culture there of acceptance around breastfeeding. Um, I think to go back to your point about 
um, increased childcare. It's also increasing the quality uh, of the childcare and the experience that children have while they're in childcare. So um, they're learning how to, to read, they're learning how to play, they're learning how to interact. Um, they are hopefully getting better uh, nutrition and all that is feeding um, back uh, to the families as well. But in terms um, of breastfeeding, um, I think uh, when this was being discussed on the radio the other morning, um, the uh, people involved were praising um, the Scottish approach to breastfeeding, and I think we've got Elaine Smith to thank for the Breastfeeding Act uh, of 2005, which was the first of its kind uh, in the UK, um, and only one of a few in the world, uh, where it makes an offence to stop a person uh, breastfeeding, and perhaps Claridge's and other um, outlets and organisations ought to to, to be aware of that, but um, Scotland has increasingly, um, Aileen mentioned the, the UNICEF uh, Baby Friendly Awards, and Scotland has increasingly um, been at the top of these awards uh, compared to every other region uh, of the UK. So I think we should um, be quite proud of what has happened in Scotland in relation to breastfeeding. My, my constituency office is, I, I have a, a, a notice up saying that this is if a mother wants to feed their baby that they can do so. All you need, I think, is to make sure that you've got somewhere that's quite calm, has appropriate seating, has water. So we could all probably take a lead as well on that respect, make sure all our constituency offices offer that. Well, take, take up your <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure your grandson or granddaughter might find himself in that situation. Uh, uh, my, my grandson, when he, the first day he went to nursery, actually took his jacket off and said, bye, Mum. You know, oh, and, and <laughs> ran, ran, ran straight in, no, to, to his mother, ran straight into to, to play. So I welcome the increase hours, and I also welcome uh, Elaine uh, Smith's uh, law in regards to. And there and, are key, and, key and important milestones promoting. beyond the early years that show why it is important to get it right in the early years in adolescence, at the transitions from primary to secondary, the key, key milestones and key developmental milestones that kind of show and point back to a good experience in. Uh, earlier settings. Thank you. I uh, don't, don't want to be a pain in this and I don't necessarily require an answer, but some feedback would be useful in regard to our earlier discussions about how we evaluate and what our objective is for the child care policy. We mentioned earlier, and it's been referred to, proportionate universal, universalism. I think the Minister mentioned that, and certainly um, Professor Marmot, who, who, who gave us evidence, mentioned that. It would be interesting, given that this is a relatively new initiative in terms of the child, child care, that we have evaluated it for in, inequalities and what we expect that that would, uh, how that would, that would help, and that we've not got any inverse um, uh, 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 situation operating there. Um, uh, you know, how do, how do we, how do we within that look after the? The, the, the very vulnerable children that will be within that, that whole spectrum. Do we widen the gap between the poorest and the better off by the application of that, or do we narrow the gap in what evaluation maybe was taken? Is that sorry, I, I had struggled. Was that specifically for childcare? No, I, yeah, on the, on the childcare policy you've, you know, that has been recently discussed and you described, uh, what evaluation, what, how, how is that poverty proofed? How, how do we ensure that uh, the, the inequality uh, that it currently exists is improved by that policy? And what evaluations took place there? I think in terms of, of inequalities, I think um, that was uh, well set out in the equally well document that, we, that department, departments should be sure that they, they're, they're not building in inequalities into anything that they do. Um, for example, um, you, you know, we, we encourage, as you know, cross-departmental approaches. Um, and one example mentioned in the last task force report um, of LinkUp was a project run by Inspiring Scotland, which received funding from both Justice and Health, and health uh, which looked to um, enable communities that are asset poor to develop and grow. So I think all the departments are well aware of making sure that they don't build inequalities into their work. But, you know, I think what's been said uh, today and uh, with your, um, your panel last week 
is that you know a lot of the inequalities are a result of things that aren't within control of the Scottish Government. And we've noticed, for example, that where um, people are on the living wage, it has helped to reduce inequalities. The, uh, what I was trying to mean, you know, not going on about it, I mean, you feed back, maybe uh -huh. it's my poor communication, but <laughs> if you apply a universal policy uh -huh. that's available to ever rich or poor, mm -hmm. How, 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 how did you ensure that that was a measure that was tackling inequality? That's, that's what I'm basically well, asking. Well, what evaluation took place to ensure that that was going to narrow the gap between rich and poor, and how does it do it? Uh -huh. the, Why is it an inequality measure? Childcare. I'll go back to childcare. The 600 hours, moment. the flexibility, what, why is that an inequality uh -huh. measure? Well, so there's a high take-up of, of childcare, about 90%, so already you've got a kind of good base of being able to compare and contrast. The Growing Up in Scotland uh, longitudinal study has has, uh, has key data about the improvements that that can make and the reduction in inequalities that that can create, it's provided, though, that it is of high quality, which is why it's important we're not just uh -huh. talking about the economic drivers, but it's about making sure that that child is getting a quality uh, provision. Uh, we know that um, at the age of 14, the benefits of high quality early learning childcare continue at that age. Uh, and they particularly benefit those children who are from uh, deprived uh, backgrounds uh, as well. Uh, Five-year-olds as well, we, we get improved cognitive uh, development, improved speech and language development as well. So there are key milestones along the way that point mm -hmm. back to this expansion being important because the more hours you give, the, the quality of those hours as well allows us to try and begin to tackle some of those inequalities around attainment and, and later years through the um, all, all the children, th those who are in an advanced pos position in this e inequality scale, all children would benefit from that policy. So how does that... But is how, does that how does that policy help? So, it, so we have the three and four-year-olds. All children across Scotland are entitled to the 600 hours, but we're targeting the most vulnerable for this year, 15% of two-year-olds, next year up to 27%. So we're getting earlier with our interventions. And again, I'm stressing the point that it has to be a quality provision as well, particularly for those age groups as well, which is why we're making sure through the Professor Siraj uh, commissioned work that um, the workforce is as well developed as we can possibly make it. The care inspectorate also have a role to play in terms of in ensuring inspection and quality is there. Uh, and again, though, we know from the results in later life that if we tackle some of those deep-rooted sources of inequality in early years, that those children can go on at the markers of milestones around speech and language, transitions to secondary school, that, that we, can, we can try and reverse some of those, in, uh, those trends in inequality. And I think it's also important to then recognise the, that, that that work plus the Early Years Collaborative, plus the work that then takes forward the work around raising attainment for all, which is the collaborative around um, is it P1 to um, P7. Yes, it's, yeah. um, that work as well, there's providing a thread there to ensure that we're tackling inequalities in, in an educational sense, but also rooting it back always to the early years. Just today, convener, um, there's the uh, SCOTPO, the Scottish Public Health Observatory, have uh, published a report on, on health inequalities. And while it doesn't just focus on the early years, it does point to um, the interventions that do make a difference in health inequalities. But I think also, going back to health visitors, it's giving them the responsibility um, and making decisions that they know where to best spend their time to make a difference with families that need um, more help. Call in care. terms of the childcare as well, it's important that every child, and we don't just talk about targeting yeah. others, that yeah, all children that, deserve that, the best start in life as well. That's my point. I was, I was <laughs> we're talking about inequalities and how we reduce, reduce the gap between mm -hmm. the most vulnerable and the, and the well off. Uh, so we've got that targeted universalism as well within that kind of policy well, in itself. That's, you know, that, I don't, well, we'd be glad to hear some more about how, how we got to that targeted universalism, that proportional universalism, that universalism plus whatever we call it, that universalism on its own doesn't seem 
to be able to do, do its, its, its something in addition to that, I think, that we're examining as a committee. Colin Kia. Uh, thanks, convener, and good morning to you. Um, we've heard quite a lot about health visitors um, in this morning's discussion. I'm thinking more in terms of the GPs and how you feel that the role that they play over the next few years, uh, uh, how their role will evolve as these new policies are rolled out. I think GPs um, are just one part of the jigsaw and in terms of uh, community planning partnerships, they'll obviously be um, an important part of that. Um, but I think the main, hopefully, the main uh, point of contact um, will be the health visitors um, um, and I think family nurse partnerships um, are key here. But obviously, um, GPs will have a role, but hopefully, you know, it will not be needed in the front line because we're hopefully, you know, making sure that people are healthier in the early years, but clearly they have a role. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, community uh, uh, planning partnerships, amongst other things. Um, just in the last week, in, indeed, uh, the audit committee, the Auditor General uh, was a bit critical of community planning partnerships generally as they haven't evolved as quickly or as painlessly, shall we say, over the past decade um, in terms of uh, how they work and, and the likes. And do you see any difficulties with rolling out any of these policies? Is every, everyone buying into it? Anything particularly um, difficult in having these policies enacted at local level simply because of the difficulties that, say, local authorities have with NHS boards and various others? Um, well, I have, was at a meeting of community planning partnerships uh, last week, and um, I think you're right. Um, the, uh, the rollout has been patchy. There are some much further ahead um, than others. But I think um, in terms of the work uh, between government uh, and COSLA and the health boards, um, this, is, this is where we're going, this is where we're at, and it's incumbent on all these bodies to work together to, to make sure that it's, it's rolled out. Um, I was just to point to my my own portfolio around the earlier task force, which um, brought kind of key partners around the table, but was had a direct link in with the community planning partnerships. And the key change that came from it was again the earlier collaborative, which has shown you know huge take up. You know there was 700 plus at each learning session in the SECC, to, which um, showed I think in a way that hadn't been shown before, just how up for it, the community planning partnerships were about tackling um, the, the issues that they are dealing with uh, in their local authorities and their health boards as well. So all 32 local authorities are involved in that. All 32 local authorities are taking uh, ownership over the development of their, um, and the community planning partnerships in particular, taking ownership of the ways in which they want to move forward with the collaborative. But I think that's the key change that has resulted from the, the task force and the change fund, which again, that was the first time we had a a uh, financial mechanism which brought to bear <coughs> monies from the Scottish Government, local authorities and health boards uh, as, as, as well. So, you know, that, I think for, from that point of view that there is a lot to be very positive about in, in terms of the role of local authorities and health boards and all the community planning partners that um, are participating, particularly in the early years collaborative. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Um, with your permission, committee member, do you want to ask another question? Very briefly, the, the public health review that's uh, going to take place, um, I understand there's no public health directors on it, and I find that um, really interesting because we had a discussion with the previous Cabinet Secretary about where public health should be placed. Um, obviously, in England, they've gone for placing them in the local authorities, although I think there are difficulties with that. It's very patchy, the results. But I just wonder if, you could, if we could get the committee could be supplied with the terms of the, the review, the chair, who, who's chairing it, and uh, some rationale for not having a, a, a director of public health, either a Scottish one or one from uh, externally, which actually might be quite useful to have someone from England who's got experience of how they've gone through their review and you know, what's happened with the transfer. 
So, but I do find it incomprehensible that there's no public health director on this review, as I understand it. Okay, we can certainly get that information to you. Fed by that, I did say it was a quick one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that is very quick for you, Richard. Thank you very much. But not, 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 not nonetheless important. But th thank you, thank you. Can I thank the ministers and the team who have been with us this morning? It's a very challenging and complex area, and uh, we, we, we all struggle with that. Um, and thank you all very much uh, for coming along, giving your, your time and your evidence, uh, which we'll take into account in our, our report. Thank you again. Um, we're going to. Yeah, and to, and to you, very nice. Yes, I need to remember that this is our last uh, committee before then. Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas. Well. Um, we suspend briefly at this point to um, get the next panel in.
We now move to agenda item number five, which of course is to take evidence uh, from the Scottish Government officials on winter resilience. And we have uh, Geoff Huggins, Acting Director of Health and Social Care Integration, Alan Hunter, Dep Deputy Director, Performance Management and National Programme Director, Unscheduled Care Programme, uh, Shirley Rogers, uh, Deputy Director, Workforce, all from the Scottish Government, and Dr Daniel Beckett, Consultant Physician, physician at NHS uh, Fourth Valley. Um, thank you all for your attendance this morning. I think we're going to have a, a, some a, a brief comment, are we, from... I'm just going to ask the team to say a wee bit more about their experience, but we're not going to offer extensive remarks or anything. Right. OK, then. Thanks. Thanks for that. And then we'll move directly to questions. Yes. Thank you. OK. So uh, I'm Jeff Huggins, Acting Director for Health and Social Care Integration. The particular areas of interest for me are around delayed discharge, around health and social care integration and around primary care. And I'm supported on my left by... Hi, I'm Shirley Rogers. I have responsibility for Health Workforce and for Quest. I have a particular interest as the Chair of the um, Task Force on Sustainability and Seven Day Services. Alan Hunter, and I've uh, been with the Scottish Government now for almost a year. Uh, I came in from uh, on secondment uh, from Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, where I was a general manager uh, in the acute sector for about uh, 14 years. And prior to that, I've had experience in other hospitals in, in Scotland and, and in England. Um, I'm Dan Beckett. I'm the current uh, Chief Medical Officer Specialty Advisor for both Acute and General Medicine uh, and also have uh, a role as the National Clinical Lead for the uh, Whole System Patient Flow Improvement Project. Uh, I'm the Associate Director of Standards at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh uh, and uh, Consultant Physician in Acute Medicine uh, in NHS Fourth Valley, which is where I spend most of my time. Thank you all for that. Uh, Richard Simpson, I think, is asking our first question. Um, we've been fortunate over the last few years of having relatively mild winters, and hopefully we may be fortunate again. But um, my concern is that the number of delayed discharges, which was, has dro been dropping since it was originally defined as over six weeks, and there were 3,000 of them in 2002 3 when the programme came in, the... Um, Labour government reduced it considerably. The SNP government, to give them credit, reduced it to zero by March 2008. But the numbers in the last three years have risen. And we're now, the last report, 450,000 bed days occupied, the equivalent of 1,100 beds occupied in our acute sector every day of the year. So given that particular problem and the fact that the local authorities are cash-strapped, um, what, how are you going to actually ensure that our health service manages a, the situation if it's an even moderately bad winter uh, and is able to continue with elective surgery? Because from what I hear, there are a number of the boards are predicting that elective surgery, cancellation of operations, etc., uh, are going to increase significantly over this winter period, which means your legal targets are not going to be met by even more, for even more Scots than the 10,000 annually for whom that legal guarantee, legal guarantee is not met at the present time. OK. Um, I'll, I'll say a bit about where we are on, on delayed discharge, and then I'll bring Alan in afterwards to talk a bit about elective and, and the, work, the work there. Um, first of all, I should refer back to the statement and the comments that the new First Minister made in her speech on the programme for government. Um, that this is um, the issue of delayed discharge is one that this government is quite clearly committed to tackling uh, and will be taking action to do so. Um, we, uh, in the speech, she also set out the additional £15 million that would be spent um, across the winter period to take additional steps in individual partnerships to reduce the number of people who are delayed discharges. And I, I can say a bit about that work, I guess, as an illustration of what's actually happening in practice. Um, so if we think about you know, the work that's going on in you know, NHS Fife, um, you know, they are doing work to include, increase the number of step-down beds, so the ability to move people on appropriately um, at the point when they're ready for discharge from hospital into a location in the community as part of the process of ideally returning them home. And, and they, they anticipate through the work that they're taking forward and have commenced that they will take a bite 
of 60 people relatively quickly out of their current number of delayed discharges. Um, in Glasgow, um, we have a system where the health board and the councillor are now working towards a process of um, discharge for assessment. So for those for whom, again, it's appropriate that they would be they wouldn't sit in a hospital bed waiting for an assessment but would return home quickly to then be assessed and then move on. So we're, we're seeing that the five, five million offered by the Scottish Government together with the contributions being made by health boards and by local authorities along with the LUCAP money, the unscheduled care money from earlier in the year and the five million that we allocated in the summer is being used, used in very targeted ways which are both looking at the short term challenge but also looking beyond that to build systems which don't simply transfer the problem elsewhere. Um, clear, clearly, the, the intention around um, integration and the work on delayed discharge is to release that pressure on the NHS system by ensuring that the whole system works effectively. And, and that means that we need to do more, um, more evidence-based um, approaches within hospital that enable us to then work across the hospital care boundary. We're also doing um, some work on a, on a national basis, and we've been engaging with the care inspectorate um, in terms of work that they can do to assist us in ensuring that care homes are able to take people, that the quality that they're offering doesn't mean that either local councils or they themselves put a block on people going out into the care home. So they're now offering targeted support here in City of Edinburgh, where access to care homes has been a particular issue, but are also taking that approach into other areas where access to care homes is something which may cause a, a delay. Um, we're, we're, we're working through the work of the Residential Task Force to also think carefully about how we would want to use care homes in the future. So in, instead of uh, beginning to move increasingly to see them as part of a system of care, the objective of which is to enable people to stay at home for as long as possible, so we would see care homes, in many cases, not being long-term residences for people. You know, home is the appropriate long-term residence for people. That's what they tell us. So care homes having a different function in the system than they might have had a, a period of time before. So we're taking that fo work forward in collaboration with COSLA uh, and, and with other colleagues. But we're also working very directly with particular partnerships, building on the work that we've been doing in Fife um, to begin to anticipate um, how things might operate under integration. So in that context, we've been working directly with the chief officer, as well as both the partners, to talk through what different solutions they might be adopting during 1516, when the integration partnerships begin to come on stream. And we've asked them to think and do that now, um, in that there is no reason to wait to do sensible things. And you know, they're clearly, uh, as a partnership, stepping up the mark, to the mark to do that. Internally within the Scottish Government, we are, we've now established a programme board, um, again, to actively manage delayed discharge across the winter period, um, which will meet weekly, which will look at the, I'll describe it as the grey data, the data that we get on a weekly basis, which is unvalidated and you know, which, you know, you know, which uh, isn't the, the data that we would publish, but also to identify across the period whether there are particular challenges or blockages that we might want to become involved in. So. We see this as an area where local systems are, are best placed to be able to design and develop local solutions, but there needs to be a strong engagement between the, the centre and localities. So our, our objective is to, is to move the dial on delayed discharge um, across the winter period. Can I say that? Thank you for that very comprehensive uh, reply. I, ha I have two concerns. I should declare, convener, that I have two interests in this. One is I'm I'm the director of a nursing home, but it is based in England, I'm glad to say. So it isn't relevant to the Scottish situation, but it does give me experience of what's actually happening uh, in terms of local delayed discharge in the area of the nursing home. And secondly, my, uh, my wife is head of social care, social care for a council, so uh, that's relevant to the second question. Some of the, um, some of the local authorities, like Stirling and Clackmanager, have no delayed discharges um, because they have reintroduce social workers into the hospital to make sure there's early assessment on admission, not on discharge, not when they're ready for discharge, rapid admission. But how are your systems going to ensure that there isn't a perverse incentive in this, in that the areas that have not been successful, have not got step-down beds, have not been using 
care homes for short-term uh, provision temporarily before going home that don't have, um, as they have in Edinburgh for under under Peter Gabitas, they have good integrated nursing and social care that picks people up for 10 weeks uh, and assesses what they need. How are you going to ensure that there aren't perverse incentives that you're simply rewarding the areas that have not been successful? Because that really in the long term is self-defeating. Certainly, I, I, I would agree. And the, the approaches that we're looking at um, and working on with particular partnerships, our intention is that those should apply across the system in, in that um, what we are seeing is the challenges of chronicity, of multimorbidity, of more people for living, living for longer. Um, and those have become pronounced in particular situations, um, such as um, Edinburgh and the Lothians, where we have challenges around access to particular types of service, similarly in Grampian and, and Aberdeen City. But the, the challenges which are faced here, if we don't see reform across the system, will be faced elsewhere. Um, and, and so we need to take that long-term view about how we're strategically taking forward the whole social care system, because simply the fact that a particular area isn't challenged at this stage doesn't mean that it won't be challenged next year. So we, we're, we're entirely conscious of that. Sorry, did you want us to say something also about elective care, or do you want to take that for a later question? Well, it may be somebody else will come back on that. It's certainly obviously a very important, important area. But uh, it, I'm really thinking of, for example, if, if you have step-down beds already, you're not going to get rewarded by fun, funding to increase your step-down beds. If you're running a hospital-at-home scheme and it's effective and cost-effective, you're not going to get rewarded for introducing that. So it's, I, I'm just not clear that the that areas like Stirling and Clackman and Chef, which have got no delayed discharges, which have made a big effort, you know, which are developing, have got step-down assessment, etc. Uh, are they going to be able to be rewarded? Because they're in deficit. All these local authorities are in deficit. Every single social care budget is in deficit. They're all struggling enormously. Uh, and, and, you know, how they can produce five million to match when, if they've already got these things in position, should that not be account accounted as as their contribution towards the five million you're producing? It, 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 it's, I suppose it's important to say that what we're seeing across partnerships is that in addition to the work which is being funded by the, the additional money, that partnerships are also taking other actions. So some of the work that's going on within, within Fife, where we've been very directly involved, is being funded directly by the, the health board. In that, you know, they, they have looked at the, the sums, they've looked at the structure, and that they have identified that it makes more sense for them to spend you know, the next £100,000 in a community location than it does in a hospital location. They'll offer a better quality of care. Um, it'll be more financially efficient. And, you know, it, importantly, it responds directly to what it is that people are looking for, which is to go home. So, so we're seeing a flexible use of resource. If, if we think about what was said by the former Deputy First Minister uh, when she introduced the proposals in respect of integration... Um, back in December of 2010, she talked about the need for us to think uh, from the perspective of the individual who was receiving care and to no longer think purely in organisational terms between the NH the NHS this or council that and to think about how we applied money and effort across the system. So we're beginning to get into that space and you know, our sense is that's where the solution to the, the challenge that you put down, which is a real challenge, will come from. Can I just conclude on that point by saying... In 2009, the Integrated Resources Framework Programme started, and I'm still waiting to see, and I hear from my colleagues in local authorities, that many of them don't even know about the Integrated Resource Framework spreadsheet. That is fundamental to the integration budget, and yet it is not published. We don't know, you know, we don't know what they are. Um, it, you know, we're within six months of the first budget for, for these groups, uh, and yet... You know, they don't, have, they don't have access to it. And they've asked for it. I know they've asked for it. I, I think that's certainly something which I can take away because I, I certainly know that as part of the process that's been taken forward at the moment, I have colleagues who are working for me and colleagues outside the Scottish Government who are routinely now using that information yes. on the ground. Yes. Um, Perfect so in Ross, I know. Really I, 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 can think of, I can think of five partnerships um, on the basis that the data from five partnerships recently arrived on my desk 
and took a space up about this high. Right. It, uh, and the granularity and, and, the, and the understanding that we were taking from that was really good. Yeah. So if, if there is a genuine challenge there, we can certainly follow up on that, and I'm happy to do so. That would be very helpful. In that our our objective is to ensure that this process is underpinned by data. Thank you. Okay. Your question? Uh, to that, um, in regards to uh, council nursing homes, you know, previously councils over the years have closed uh, nursing homes because of the fact that they were en suite. Um, what action are we taking to discuss with councils to ensure that they're, they're signing up to this new step up, step down situation? We're, we'll, we'll be doing targeted work over the next couple of months in, the, in those areas where we would take benefit from actually having more um, nursing home places in that it, across, across Scotland we have a number of unoccupied nursing home places but they don't they're not necessarily in those locations where we'd most take benefit. We, we also have the challenge of how much it would take to bring a particular home back into use but certainly um, at the moment we have City of Edinburgh working with NHS Lothian working to bring Pentland Hills back into use um, but also there are other properties within the Lothians which could be considered in a similar way um, and I, I, I I think within, within the Lothians, there's certainly one of those which is a council um, location. So it's, it's an issue which we, we have on the agenda and have clearly identified as an area where we can... So we're working to ensure that councils are not shutting down nursing homes that we may need, need within the next uh, well, period of time? Well, we're, we're very cl clearly concerned that any service which is provided needs to be of a high quality and meet the expectations. Um, within that, there are small flexibilities around four inches here or six inches here, which can be applied flexibly by the care inspectorate. But there are clearly some homes which it would be more straightforward to bring back into use or to maintain in use than others. And we're, we're looking for that proportional sort of approach. So, but that's one of the items which we've clearly identified as an area where we can do more working with partnerships. And again, that reflects the engagement process between ourselves and partnerships. Uh, that was my supplementary. I still have a question later on. And Richard and ask for some clarity around the step down uh, and, and the flow through that has been mentioned um, by recent uh, announcements and press for the Scottish Government indeed. But when I, when I heard your response this morning and, and I looked at um, Glasgow Clyde's winter resilience plans, they seem to identify the step down not just as a, a winter provision, but something that they're doing uh, as part of their forward planning. So I, I think we need to have some maybe clarity about that, although the publicity has said this is what we're going to do and we're going to have these step-down facilities. You know, the scant look-at plans is that they're, they're not there yet, or are they? Uh, how much additional provision is actually now available Across Scotland, to as uh, you know, for you know, for for winter resilience planning, and what is the longer term uh, uh, look at step down facilities? Because, we, you know, as Richard Simpson said earlier, unfortunately, it's not just in the winter that you can have this high bed occupancy and uh, the de delayed discharge. So there seems to be a couple of things going 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 on here. I'll, 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 I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that. Um, step up and step down facilities are 365 a day, 365 days a year facilities, and they're part of the, they, you know, they are the future, they're a key component of the future component of care within Scotland. They're already in use across Scotland, although not, um, not in a consistent way in all local authorities. And so you know, our, our objective around that is that they increasingly should be seen as as being the, the first step either for assessment or for re-ablement um, on, on the basis that there's an understanding that many people having had a period of time in hospital then require some additional support to get back to the full level of functioning that enables them to then return home. My, 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 my own aunt, and this is a personal story, um, around six years ago went through one of these facilities in Northern Ireland where she's resident um, and had four weeks and then a further two weeks and has then gone home and is now around 90 and has been living at home for six years since going through that process, having had 
uh, a period of about eight weeks in hospital during which she picked up a hospital acquired infection and and so that's 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 the future because people tell us they don't want to go to a care home or a residential setting where they lose their autonomy they want to take every step which enables them to go back to their own home and to be maintained so it, it's a strategic approach which will be taken right across the system so there is some additional uh, we're accelerating that in the run-up to this winter and, and that's what we're offering support to some partnerships and some partnerships are using it for that purpose but it, it's it's core to how the business will be delivered yeah, yeah, yeah so we're accelerating that so what does that mean then in terms of step up facilities and what extra have been put you know if we concentrate now on the resilience that we've got it in a context so as resilient as resilience planning what what additional capacity are we creating in glasgow Clyde? because when i looked at their plan they they they, they seem to suggest that this is something they're doing not for winter re resilience planning maybe reading it wrong but it's something that is longer term and strategic so what extra uh, you know, uh, capacity is available in the various health boards as a result of the step up. In, in, in Glasgow, their intention is to produce 90 beds, which are basically beds for assessment, which will be a, a continuing component of their system, um, with the objective that they will then discharge people within three days of being ready to discharge, which is also you know, clinically indicated. To what? That's additional to what they've had previously. Um, you know, in Fife, they are looking at two 30 bedded units. Um, so that, that's how some of the half the five million which has been allocated is, is being used across the, the current period. Um, it's also been used in one or two other areas for the same, in the same way. In, in other areas, either because of the current structure of the service or the availability of the location where they could offer that, it's not part of the current use of the resource which has been offered over this period but our strategic engagement with partnerships is looking to see it as being a component of all systems and services. I'm not sure that we have an audit which enables us to make that distinction at this stage between different types of bed to actually show change over time, but you know, we could begin to look at how we might ca capture that. No, your answer is I'm perfectly happy with your answer that there is an additional capacity being um, you know, made, a, made available. It wasn't clear from the, the, the set, but in terms of the finance, can we be, 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 be more clarity around, you know, there's a number of figures be, being banded about in the last couple of days, 15 million, 18 million, a million that was allocated in August. Some of that money is, you know, approximately what, half of it has already been allocated. You know, so, so there seems to be um, there's, you know, there's... various pockets of money um, that has been, you know, they've either been added up, uh, brought together once or twice, um, and uh, you know the comparison uh, to the, the amounts of money it was made last year in a letter to the committee from uh, the cabinet, then cabinet saying Alec Neil and his provision of uh, money for uh, winter resilience planning. What is the, what is the increase on last year, and what is the actual figure we're talking about? What what's the new money this year? The, the, the position that we're at during 2014-15 um, is that there's been three allocations that are, are relevant. There is five million that were allocated in the summer, and I'm going to say that was June. Is that correct? August. Oh, August. Um, there was eight million which has been allocated through the LUCAP, which is part of the larger amount that would have been included within the letter, which covered a three-year period um, during during last year. And then there is the five million which has been um, which is currently uh, being, being issued, which is also being supplemented by contributions by, from NHS boards and from local authorities. So eff effectively, we're looking at, from central government, 18 million, which has gone out across the period, but also recognising um, the contributions being made by local partners um, you know, as NHS boards and as local authorities. And what was, how did that compare from last year? And then does that... We invested nine million from uh, the LUCAP funding last year. So the, the extra ten million that uh, has been focused in on de uh, delayed discharge is an additional sum. So we've we've more than doubled the money that went in last year. More than doubled that. that, that, they, that. The, yes, the central uh, allocation. Did that money flow through over the years, or is it new money? You know, it's new money this year, um, uh, and it. it the look at money went out in August with the first five million tranche, and then the second five million went out uh, in November. 
In terms of the, the money, um, as part of the process of encouraging partnerships to think of themselves within the integration framework, we're also at the moment beginning to receive the proposals that they have to spend the £100 million integration fund. And, and again, we will be looking to see the degree to which the use of that resource s supports our objectives around delayed discharge. Yeah. And so that's been used to buy up some of those beds that, are, that are... That's money that will appear in 2015-16, so that, that's looking forward to next year. Right. Um, but it, it means that as people are making decisions over this winter, they can do so thinking that there will be, you know, with the understanding that there is resource support during the, the coming year. Yes, um, so. Colin, you wanted to do yeah, a step there? Yeah, it was, you mentioned um, uh, Lodian and the fact that they've managed to get a hold of Pentland, the old Pentland care home. Uh, what kind of uh, numbers are we talking about in terms of what they're going to use it for and the dent it will make in essentially the problem area that they have, which is obviously in delayed discharge? What kind of help is that going to be and how have they managed to fund it, basically? They've used some of the allocation that we've offered, um, but that allocation clearly won't be sufficient for the work over the period of time that they'll, they'll be doing it. So they've found money between the Health Board and, and the Council. Um, in the short term, their intention is to bring into use 60 beds for step down, um, and they anticipate that they will have 60 beds available from the middle of January. So it will take a significant bite out of the Lothian figure. Um, and, that, and, and, you know, and that's the basis on which they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, the home itself, I think, historically has been 120 beds. Um, and the, the 60 beds which they're bringing in relatively quickly are the ones for which that's more straightforward to do. Mm. Um, but, of course, you know, they will want to um, be confident about being able to staff and to uh, ensure that the, 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 new, you know, the new service which they offer there offers, uh, operates effectively as a step-down facility having historically, of course, been run as a residential care home. So yeah. it's, it's looking to, it'll be looking to a different service model. Mm -hmm. But it will take a big bite out of the problem for them. OK. Thanks. Richard Lyle. There are 365 days a year out of our service, NHS 24, um, work um, to where, when doctor surgeries close uh, and basically uh, cope with the, the service. What planning have we got in place for this year? Taking on board that Christmas... Uh, possibly doctor surgeries will close on Wednesday and not open until the Monday. Uh, so out of hours, they'll have to cope between 6 p.m. on the Wednesday to Thursday, Friday, all day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, till Monday 8 a.m. and the same at New Year, uh, over and above what they already do. What, what planning is in place to ensure that we've got sufficient cars, sufficient doctors, and also to cope with any possible snow weather that we, got, that we have on the horizon? Uh, I'll, I'll cover the in, initial part of the, com the question, which is around the um, resilience that NHS 24 is, is building in. Um, and I'll then bring in Shirley to talk a wee bit about workforce and making sure we've got enough people, um, which I think was the second part. Um, the NHS 24 um, winter plan is on their website. Um, as we've asked all, all boards to place their winter plans on the website. And, and it sets out exactly what they expect at this stage to, to happen. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're predicting that the 2nd of January will be the busiest day that they've ever had um, this year. And th there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, where it falls in the particular candle, in the, ca in the calendar, where it falls in the, in the calendar. But also that since the introduction of the new 111 number um, in the summer, they've seen roughly a 20% increase in calls generally. So they, they now have a service which is being more used by the public um, at a time when they would expect to be busier. So they, 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 are, they are basing their expectation about what they will need to do across the two four-day weekends, but with a particular focus on a couple of spikes in that, which are the, which are the Saturdays, probably. Um, and they are ensuring that they have the establishment on deck on those days to be able to respond to more calls than they've ever had before. In particular, they've recruited um, an additional 65 call handlers for the period, so they will have more people available. I, I guess that gives you the story of what they do if what they expect to happen happens. Um, and beyond that, they've looked at um, resilience and continuity and contingency should 
what happens be different from what's anticipated. And that's been a wee bit of the story, I think, for them during 2014 already, which is that the 111 number, um, call rates to it have been less predictable than they were to the previous number. So they're seeing more day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week volatil volatility. So they've already had to be more fleet of foot across the year in terms of actually responding to different pressures um, across the current number. So they'll, they're going to take that learning in. But the, the plan that they've laid out, um, which, is on, which is on the web, um, deals with the different me methodologies that they will take to address different challenges um, in terms of particular spikes in call volume um, and the process by which they will um, prioritise clinically, um, clinically significant calls, and the, the process by which they'll bring people back to the desks, the, the process by which they'll extend shifts and indeed bring people in, should that be, be required. They themselves sat down last week and you know, they, they take this work extremely seriously and consider their plan again, having submitted it, having put it on the web. Uh, and uh, the board spent um, a significant chunk of their time considering were there other things that they could do um, uh, to address other contingencies. And they're now considering whether there are other steps that they might build in to, 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 to become more robust. One, one little nugget, which I think is quite interesting, though, out of what we've been seeing over the recent period, is that we, we do appear to be seeing a, something which might suggest um, that over weekends and in current out-of-hour periods, because we do, we run 52 out-of-hour periods every year, because um, every weekend is an out-of-hour period, we are beginning to see something which suggests that people are making the choice to contact NHS 24, um, which may be having an impact on A&E attendances over weekends. And that, that's been quite, it's, it's suggested in some of the data. And, you know, I'd be really cautious to suggest a big, you know, behavioural shift, although clearly that's the sort of behavioural shift that we look for. Um, but it's beginning to suggest that people's, people are thinking about NHS 24 in a different way, and perhaps the 111 number has contributed to that. Shirley, do you want to say something about workforce? Yeah. Just about having the people. Thank you. Uh, I think you've given a picture around community services. If I can perhaps touch on the acute sector for, for a little um, in terms of that response. I mean, clearly, o overall winter, our expectation is that boards will adopt the Scottish Government winter planning protocols, and those specifically ask them to look at rotors during um, festive holidays, disruptions from whatever source, whether that's norovirus, whether it's increased activity for whatever other reason. Um, whether that's travel, slips, falls, icy weather type issues. We've particularly asked for a focus around four specialties that relate to those, um, one being emergency medicine for the obvious reasons of that, but also gastroenterology, geriatric medicine, respiratory medicine, um, to allow us to be able to deal with uh, respiratory conditions arising from flu and those kinds of things. We have a specific targeted piece of work around um, those four-day periods. It's not the first time we've had four-day periods, but nonetheless, they are always those that make you thoughtful about service provision, so we spend a bit of time focusing on that. Um, you'll have seen some of the data that was produced by ASD Scotland at the beginning of December. Um, that data suggests to us that NHS boards properly using the, the methodologies that we talked about earlier on in terms of rosters and so on should have sufficient staff. Um, over the past couple of years, we've moved into risk-based workforce planning across staffing borders, and we've tried to um, make sure that boards anticipate any areas. And at this stage, boards are not alerting us to any specific areas of, of huge concern in terms of that four-day period. Can I, can I welcome the point that Mr Huggins made? And I, I, I have to say I, I had previous experience of driving the of ours, and the situation is that if you do phone NHS 24, you immediately get an appointment. You don't need to wait in a &E. You just go straight in, get your appointment, see the doctor, or indeed the nurse. Uh, with, uh, in, in some occasions, the nurse can cope with the, the, the doctor's uh, uh, situation. Uh, and basically, that would relieve, and I would encourage people to do that, that, that would relieve the pressure on a and &E at, at the time. Because having worked in, in hospitals, on a Christmas and a, and, and a New Year's Day, uh, and also the 2nd of January, uh, I've seen the, the, the pressures on a &E and and the service at the time. Thank you for your comments. 
there has been a bit of publicity over GP practices and not being available. And uh, I noticed one of our old friends, Dr. Bust, uh, was on last night saying that GP practices are available over that four, period, that four day period. Uh, uh, do we know what GP practices will be available? Uh, I, I, I guess I maybe come back to the comment I, I began with, which is that 52 weekends of the year we're, we're delivering an, an out of our service. So, you know, our general approach is that during weekends and during holiday periods that we will offer an out of our service, which is a combination of GP out of ours plus NHS 24. Um, we've already had one four day weekend this year in that the Easter weekend was also a four day weekend. Uh, and you know, so at this stage, what we're doing is going through the process with boards of ensuring that they're able to fill their rotas to deliver the four-day weekend in the same way that they would deliver any weekend. Um, you know, we're staying in contact, and as we did um, with the Easter weekend, we will also be using the opportunities when we talk to chief execs and chairs of health boards to get a sense from them about where they are on filling, filling rotas. Um, Interestingly, and this might refer to the comment, we are seeing some areas begin to think about additional opening days of normal GP surgeries. Yeah, that's what was meaning. And, yeah. and, and, and I, I guess we'll, we'll be interested, cause, and that's, that's effectively an experiment that you know, a board is right. in, engaged in. Um, at, at this stage, we, we don't know whether that is one that will be taken up by the public. You know, we don't know whether they will choose, um, or, and, we, and we don't know whether that will actually be a more effective way of delivering the service than the current you know, methodology, which is to go through NHS 24 and receive an out of hours appointment. So um, we're, we're interested in, in the, the fact that a board has decided to take that approach, but we'll, I guess we'll want to see what the implications and what the consequences of it are. You know, is, is it a benefit? Now, at the same time, we will ensure that boards are delivering a robust out of our service like they would do this weekend. So you operate on the reality which is the GP, normal GP surgeries are closed? Yeah, which is an, an every so what weekend. What was the effect in Easter on the A&E figures then when the... I don't have the A&E &E figures with me. I don't have the Easter specific right. figures uh, for the, the four day period but we can get that. Uh, to the they were up quite significantly the last Christmas, weren't they? 22 per cent or something? Was it the Over Christmas, A &E? the, um, the the previous year, um, the, the, the overall activity last year was up compared to the previous year, uh -huh. um, but uh, our performance in terms of uh, long waits was, was better, um, significantly better than the previous year. So it's not just a matter of attendances uh, to A&E that, that, that can influence it. It's a mixture of the attendances, the, the admission ratio that comes from those attendances. Um, so there, there isn't a direct correlation um, between, between the two. There's an element of risk. The, it, it, yes. Yeah. Um, Rhoda Grant. I, I think what's different about um, this holiday coming up is that out of 11 days, we're going to have GPs open for three days rather than five and seven. Yeah. So I think we're looking at quite a long period with, with very little cover. Um, that affects, obviously, people going to A&E, which you, I think you've tried to deal with. It would be useful to know how many additional beds are put in there to deal with any you know, pressure on A&E departments. Yeah. Alan, would you like to say yeah. a bit about that? Um, I've got some figures uh, on that from each of the boards. Um, as uh, Jeff said earlier, and we've, we've discussed, it, it's not just beds, because if we deal with patients, um, uh, particularly elderly patients, and just house them in the, in the hospital, that isn't always the best. So that's why we're looking to step down, looking at the different uh, capacities that we can put in place and different processes. Having said that, uh, in terms of extra uh, winter surge beds. Um, Ayrshire and Arne have uh, plans to put 14 extra acute beds in this winter compared to last, last winter. Uh, approximately 10 surge bed potential to increase further at weekends. Um, and they've also increased capacity in receiving wards through converting other beds. And they're introducing uh, frail elderly pathways to try and uh, support them at, at the front door, but also get them back into their own home with, with appropriate care. Um, in, in, in borders, um, they're also building on a, uh, an ambul ambulatory care assessment uh, unit uh, concept, and uh, they're purchasing extra um, nursing home beds over, over the, that period. 
Um, they've got a surge capacity of 25 beds, increasing to 35 beds at the weekend. Um, I'll pick um, uh, Lanarkshire um, are also um, introducing ambulatory care units um, in Wishaw and Monklands um, with capacity for 35 bed, uh, patients per day in, in those units. And they've also got 30 additional beds at Uddingston uh, and 14 additional beds uh, in Monklands from January. So uh, there's a similar range of responses in, 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 in the other boards. Beyond that, the, the figures for last year show that slightly over 5% additional staff beds were available over the winter period. And during the previous, the 2012 winter, there was a 7% more than was the norm. So uh, as part of the planning process, what boards are looking to do is to both uh, ensure that they're able to staff more beds, but also that they have more beds available just to respond to the sort of challenge that we would expect to see. What was the percentage this year? You were saying 7 what we, and 5 per cent this year. Do we know what, how many? What, 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 what Alan has outlined is capability within, or within the system to open beds. So those are beds that could be opened. So we'll only know what percentage was actually opened when we get to the post-Christmas period. But from what we've seen, that would suggest that it's a similar scale to previous years. Okay. And can I also ask about um, people with chronic conditions? Because that is another issue that people become unwell. They wait and become very unwell in that, that interim period of four days rather than uh, being seen to indeed they might have to wait the 11 days if they don't have an appointment and the three intervening days. What steps are being taken to deal with people, encourage them to contact NHS 24, keep emergency appointments for those three days available to people? Well, certainly, certainly we do encourage people with chronic conditions who may require care to approach NHS 24 and the commitment is clearly there that they will see somebody appropriate and they will receive care and treatment. So uh, as, part of, as, part, as part of the, you know, the, the winter message, we are quite clear that <clears throat> people who require treatment should come forward and seek treatment. Um, what, 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 what we do look for more generally is that for people who um, would know that they are going to require a prescription over the period or will know that the, they would require some other form of activity which isn't, um, need, doesn't need to be done on a particular day or isn't an issue that arises, that they should think ahead into the winter period. So it's, it's, but it's quite clear that that's not a message that people shouldn't seek out, that we're very clear mm -hmm. at every stage that people should, 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 should look for help. What, one of Can the, I ask, how, how are you getting that message across? You're um, saying you're encouraging people to get it. As part of the, um, uh, the winter uh, campaign, be health wise this winter it was included in that that you know attend your uh, GP in advance make sure your um, drug um, farm and approach your pharmacy early make sure you're well stocked for any um, escalation problems that you might have it, it was also included in the the winter planning guidance that went out that specifically around respiratory disease and and to, to encourage uh, boards uh, and uh, hospitals and, and GP practices to look at the anticipated care needs of uh, particularly chronic disease patients over that period. So we, we've built it in and boards are building that into their, their own uh, winter planning uh, arrangements. And just to add to that, uh, clearly there's a, 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 f a flu vaccination uh, campaign for folk uh, under the age of 65 with comorbidities much as you described so respiratory disease cardiovascular disease um, and last year uh, 60 uh, just over 60 percent were vaccinated uh, and uh, more than 75 percent so 77 percent of over uh, 65s were uh, were vaccinated uh, for and that's a sixth year in a row that we've been above the the who target for uh, for flu vaccination the other things which we've seen over <clears throat> recent years as well is almost a, a smoothing across the year effect. So um, activity has probably been maybe less pronounced in winters than it would have been historically, um, but we're seeing more activity across the year. So you're, you're seeing a pattern of activity which is um, people are more busy more of the time, but there are fewer spikes in the system in terms of, in terms of activity. <coughs> Um, and you know, that's reflected in figures such as the, the winter death figures, you know, for which you know, we've, we've seen an ongoing downward trend. And I think last year's figure was 17% down. 
on, on recent years. So it, 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 winter is clearly really significant, um, but some of the challenges now appear to be, and I, you know, it probably is attributable to things such as um, you know, better work on vaccination, better work on, on chronic care management, um, that you're, you're now seeing that you know, morbidity spread across the year rather than particularly concentrated, although we plan on the basis it'll also be concentrated. Uh, Lynette. Yes, thank you. I noticed from the, the, the government briefing um, that uh, uh, last winter there were far fewer wards closed due to norovirus, either suspected or, or confirmed. Um, is that due to any specific measures, or can you enlighten me as to why that was the case? Yes. Um, there was, and uh, there was some specific action that was taken. Um, Yvonne Curran is the, the, the senior charge at Health, um, Health Protection Scotland, and um, they, they introduced um, bay closures. So rather than uh, waiting until the whole ward was, uh, you know, and closing the whole ward, they actually closed down bays uh, and kept the, the ward operating, but uh, had stricter uh, control of infection measures for, for those bays. They also um, you know, reduced visiting around that for, for obvious reasons. And, and they believe in reviewing that 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 was the, the right thing to do. So they're, they're building that in, into the plans this year. Um, the, this year, um, they're, they're, they're going to build on that, as I say, but they're, they're also looking at um, better on-call uh, services for domestics uh, so that we can get the domestic teams in to rapidly clean uh, facilities more, more uh, earlier. And they're also introducing uh, hypochlorite um, fluid um, because they're, and they're going to trial that in four hospitals to see if that, that actually kills the norovirus um, earlier and quicker. Um, uh, they also um, believe that the, the stay at home campaign had some impact, um, which is a message that we're trying to get out if, if to, to, to relatives if, um, and, and people who are ill that it, it's better to stay at home. So if that's repeated this year, we'll hope to be in better figures next year. Won't we? we hope. It, it, it's an interesting part. Part of the experience from last year also reflected the, the fact that the strain during 2013 was the same as the strain in 2012, and that's, that's thought to have been related to it. At the same time, at the moment, we're seeing um, similar levels of norovirus to what we saw last year. In the, you know, again, s below what we you know, what we'd have seen historically. Um, as, as part of the post-winter period from last year, you know, they've done a, an evaluation of what worked um, because when something goes well, it's quite good to know why. And you know, a number of the elements that Alan's, Alan's brought out already have been part of that, and, and we're now looking at. Um, norovirus management and recording not just as whole wards but also as as, as bays I, th I think one of the key things though i think is is that there probably is more of a common understanding um with the public about why if you're ill you shouldn't go to hospital um and you know that's been you know cited by a number of the staff in responses to the to the survey work around that in that you know because people understand that people get ill in hospitals as well as get well that if they're will they, they that they're ill that they shouldn't take it there so it, it's been it's really interesting you know it we, we can't know what the story will be for all of this christmas yet but again it's looking it's looking to be in a, a good place is there any predictability about how the, the strain changes with norovirus there, there, there's advice for i think the centers for disease control isn't there is uh, well uh, hps advice uh, thus far is that there's no there's no way to predict how bad the norovirus season is going to be based on the data that we've got at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that, Minette. Uh, Bob? Um, Thank you, Convener. I want to return to the Be Health Wise This Winter um, campaign. And it makes for very interesting reading. And what struck me with it is that it's a joint responsibility between the NHS and the individual in terms of winter resilience. And we've all got our part to play as individuals within our communities. And I want to just list you some of the things that, that have come up in conversation. So when to stay at home rather than go to your GP surgery or A&E, uh, making sure you've got cold and flu remedies at home should you need them, making sure you've got enough prescriptions, knowing when your GPs are actually open over the Christmas period, where your local pharmacy is and when they're open 
and when you should go there. And I am going to go on, because it's quite important, the point I'm driving at, when to go to a minor injuries unit rather than A&E. Do you actually know you have a minor injuries unit rather than A&E? When to use out of hours and when to use NHS 24? Now, each of those things tied together gives a pretty comprehensive package of healthcare provision over the winter period. But it's a lot of information for individuals to take in. We've all got a responsibility to digest that and be aware of that and take the steps we take. But the campaign Be Healthwise this winter, whose job is it to put all that in the one card, the one piece of paper, the one portal, and get it to the individual so we can play our part in taking on our responsibilities as individuals within the community? So I'd be interested to know where... OK, I, I stay in Maryhill in Glasgow. If I wanted all that information for my local area, who am I contacting? Hmm. Um, NHS 24 are the, the lead health board um, uh, fronting the campaign. But each individual health board, as part of their winter plan, were asked and, and do carry out local uh, initiatives. And, um, so I, and I live in Stirling, and uh, there's articles and papers, and uh, I know in Lanarkshire and, and Borders specifically, they did a, a lot of work around this uh, in, in Dumfries and Galloway. So each board has a responsibility for getting that information across to the, the general public um, uh, through the, the local media. The, the, the other component to that, I guess, is that the Cabinet Secretary yesterday did the Ayrshire and Arran NHS annual review. Uh, and as part of that, the media that she did after the event, she talked about the winter message. So our challenge is that to take each opportunity to either ourselves directly or through our health boards to ensure that people have the winter message. And I have looked at, um, or I'm, I'm aware of advertising campaigns that I've seen on television and the like, but, you know, I didn't want to see that to you. It's for you to tell me what the, the message was to permeate it across Scotland. Can I, per, per, can I perhaps give you a, a suggestion or, or make a, a general point before one, one final question that I have? And um, We hear time and again that the GP should be at the, the, the centre, should be a health hub for communities. Um, most of us, just about all of us, are registered with with GPs. I'm just wondering if there's a role to play at this time of the year for a single concise message going to each household that is registered with a GP in terms of their opening times over the winter period, but also when to use minor injuries and where they are. Repeat prescriptions um, and a variety of when your local chemist shop is, when to go there, and have a variety of messages all in the one place that goes to a household just when you need them to use it the most to take strains off the system. So, again, I would say it's great that we've got this publicity campaign, but it's a kind of one-stop shop message to, to, to my constituents that, that I would be, would be looking for. So, have you given thought how to capture that? Well, my idea, OK, is the GP, I know there's a postage cost to that, but the, 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 the cost savings could be huge if a piece of work done around that. So can I get some reflections on that? And I've got one final brief question, which I think is important, which is related. I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting idea. I, I think also with new technology and new approaches, it's something which should be more straightforward to do this year than maybe five years ago. I, I think the other question and the challenge, I guess, back to us on that as well, is this is information which is valid all year, yeah. uh, minor injuries. And... Um, I, 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 I suppose the question is whether these are behaviours that you can build in across the year. You, know, you made the point around pharmacy, and with Prescription for Excellence, you know, we see pharmacists increasingly as a frontline primary care service provider. So, again, you know, that might also be a location, but I think that idea of customised local information is something that we can take away. OK, and I appreciate that. In the, the final... you, that, you send a letter out in relation to flu immunisation, so actually having the winter plan for over the Christmas period as part of that letter and saying, look, this is, the, this is when we're going to be open. Your pharmacy will or will not be open or whatever gives local information. I think it's an excellent suggestion that Bob's made. And it wouldn't cost a lot to actually say, you know, this should be done as a regular thing. We've, we've got a meeting lined up with the directors of communication from each of the health boards uh, early in January, and uh, it is a good idea. We'll, we'll build that into Just, it. GPs tell us repeatedly that they should be the centre of a community health hub, and that, 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 that this certainly gives them a, 
a, a key responsibility to take that message forward, perhaps for, for next winter. Um, the, my, my final question was, was going to be asked how we monitor the effectiveness of all these things. Of course, I'd like you to answer that. But actually, one of the things we haven't really spoken about today is um, in terms of over the winter period preparedness for uh, at-home care packages. I think we'll all know from family members that it's not just about having prescriptions, having medications, knowing when A&E is open, knowing when the chemist is open, knowing when the GPs are open, etc., etc., etc. But given the nature of leave and inconsistencies in, in staffing, perhaps in the local authorities' areas or agencies, um, how, how much work has been done to make sure if you've got a care at-home package for maybe... Four, four, I can think of, of constituents of mine who require four visits a day for primary care, fundamental primary care um, assistance, um, and to make sure that that continues seamlessly throughout the winter period. Because if we don't get that right, apart from the dignity of the individual, uh, of course, um, the, what's left open to them is family members taking them to any and the like, and particularly if it's very vulnerable, frail individuals that would be involved. It, it, it's a really important point, and it's probably the location of care that more people will receive care, care over, this week, over this winter, is care at home. Um, certainly the work that we did in 2009, when we had significant issues around access uh, and availability and travel, um, you know, with the, the snow and the ice uh, and everything, we, you know, we, we liaised very directly across that period with local government systems um, to understand that they, to ensure that they had appropriate arrangements in place to provide continuity of care, that they knew who was receiving care, what the nature and structure, and to be assured that it was, was continuing. Um, so we would look to our local government colleagues. We don't monitor that in quite the same way that we monitor the NHS. Um, it, you know, but again, that's part of the, part, part of the overall resilience work that, 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 that we will be doing. Um, a key component, I think, of how we've changed the guidance on winter for 14-15 from previous years is also that we've, we're now bringing in the interim chief officers of the integration bodies which will have that responsibility for social care and an expectation that they increasingly play a part seeing that interaction between health and social care but at, 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 at present the arrangements that we have in place are the um, resilience approach to ensuring that we've got appropriate liaison in place should winter become challenging we don't have the same degree of granularity in terms of individual services or individual authorities as, as we would for hospitals or health boards. I, I don't really have a follow-up question other than to make the observation it would appear that, that, that that's an area that across Scotland we need further work on and hopefully integration will, will help with that. But it does appear if, if, you, yeah. if, you're, if, you're, if your care visit doesn't turn up on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day, who do you call? How do you get that resolved? That kind of thing. Oh, yeah. I make a comment on that? We've been working with directors of HR from health boards and um, directors of personnel from local authorities for the past nine, ten months probably. Um, and one of the key priorities that we've asked them to focus on is joint workforce planning across both of those organisations for the delivery of integrated health and social care. Okay, thank you. You know, the, the health boards themselves in Glasgow Clyde, you know, there's about 20 bullet points in and around all of that. I think what's missing, though, is a, the evaluation. And it's quite interesting, I think, to give a plug for the joint initiative for the British Red Cross to provide transport services that supports discharging elderly planes. You know, the Red Cross is involved as well. And with the added benefit that um, they can take uh, people from A&E and &E in receiving wards a particularly well received initiative because the British Red Cross not only transport the patients home but see them settled and ensure they have basic essentials and if necessary can wait for relatives and carers. So you know there is a you know a great detail that's going on um, in terms of the planning I think but what, you know yeah. what's not obvious I think Bob is correct is that the, the same analysis of what works that you apply and the health services maybe not being applied, um, you know, in, in other areas. And uh, but but certainly the components are all, all, all they seem to be there anyway. You know, so. it, it is coming together, and we can right. see in preparation for the uh, integrated joint boards. We, 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 are, we are having much closer contact with through COSLA, but also with, directly with um, uh, the, the shadow chief officers. Um, um, the David Williams, the Chief Officer of uh, Glasgow City, 
um, is on the National and Schedule Care Steering Group. Mm -hmm. He's he's advising us. He's working with us. And um, uh, and just a, a comment: the Red Cross initiative uh, is a really good one. It, yeah. it, it works. Graeme Day, please. Uh, thank you. Kibina. Just to look at the work that's been done on improving the flow of patients through hospitals in the winter time. Um, particularly in, in regard to time of discharge. Uh, because as I understand it, one of the biggest obstacles to getting people um, who are able to, to leave the hospital out of the hospital time this way is accessing prescription medicines that are being dispensed by the in-hospital pharmacy. And it strikes me, if you found a way to crack that for the winter time, we've won a watch here for 365 days of the year. So, you know, what work's going on there? Have you found a way to tackle the pharmacy issue? Um, we are working on that and uh, our, one of our key messages through our unscheduled care programme and in our winter uh, uh, guidance is that the focus has to be on time of day discharge as well as and, and weekend discharge rates because we've got a, a significant reduction in weekend discharges and um, also the, the, the time of day makes the big difference and mm. we can get that match, that balance. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on it. Uh, if we, to answer your question, have we cracked the, the, that specific? No, we haven't yet. But in terms of the, the, the work that we've got and the programmes of work that we've, we've got uh, um, with the, the Royal Colleges of uh, Surgeons and Physicians, the Royal College of Nursing, focusing in on that, we believe that we'll be able to make the, the sort of cultural and behavioural changes that we need to, to do. Uh, the, the issue of how you get the, the, the script out quicker is around... Um, the way the, the, the ward rounds take place mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it boils down to the, the most junior doctor writing the scripts sometimes. Uh, so therefore what we're doing is looking at the way the ward rounds go, uh, change and we're, we're also introducing things like um, uh, board rounds, hospital, instead of a full ward round, just board rounds that quickly identify which patients can go home and then to prioritise that. So we are working on that. We're also looking at things like delegated discharge. Um, and in the Victoria, in Glasgow, they, they've introduced that. And in the wards they've introduced it, they've moved uh, the time of day of discharge, uh, pre-noon discharge rate from 13% uh, to around about 35%. Um, and the, so we, we've got learning events. We're, we're rolling that out so at the... Uh, our unscheduled care um, six monthly learning event in, in September that we used to, to launch the winter campaign. Um, we, we rolled that out, we, we, we had a session on that and um, uh, we're, we're developing improvement programmes around that. Just, uh, just to, to echo uh, uh, Alan's points, the, um, the pharmacy script one is, is uh, quite a difficult one to crack, but there are things you can do in terms of preemptive discharge in the night before, make sure if you've got patients who have got a care package starting the following day, the discharge script can be ready the night before to go home with the patient. Um, and I think we're really starting to better understand the reasons why people aren't going home in the morning. Uh, there's been work done on something called the day of care survey uh, that we've been uh, uh, looking at in conjunction with the Royal College of Physicians, uh, looking at patients who are in hospital at any one time and, uh, and what proportion of those are no longer needing acute care. And it depends where you look. It's, it's broadly the same, be it Scotland, be it England, be it Australia. About between 20 and 25% of patients don't need to be in, in hospital anymore. And they're waiting for various things. It could be pharmacies, you said it it could be consultant, uh, ward rounds, consultant decisions, multidisciplinary team decisions. And so having a better understanding of why these people are delayed in hospital allows us then to, uh, to, um, to, to structure the way the hospital works to look at these things specifically. Okay. Thank you, Kabir. Just two, we're nearly on schedule, just the two points. Just in the delegated powers of discharge to speed up the process, that means that, um, you know, the ward sister could discharge or an allied health professional. How is that being received by patients and families? Are they, uh, you know, in terms of, I know that, you know, that waiting in the consultant doing these rounds can delay it for, for, but there is a certain reassurance in that when we're dealing with vulnerable people, or older people in particular, maybe, uh, that, um, you know, they, they, you know, there's, you know, we're not, not being rushed out of the hospital or whatever. The criteria is that um, there's agreement against uh, a set criteria that if the patient's bloods come back and they're okay or if the, the x-ray result comes back and they're okay and there's no 
temperature. Or, so there, there's a set criteria that right. um, re gives the reassurance that, uh, to the point you've just raised. Mm -hmm. Is it widely talked a bit? I think, um, I think that communication with the patient is absolutely key. So, for example, uh, I will see patients on the ward round and I'll make very clear that I've, I think that you'll get better tomorrow. And if your temperature is better and your blood tests look better, then this is oh. my junior doctor, Dr. Smith. He'll come and see you and, and we'll get you away home if these things are met. And so they, they know that we're planning to get them away home and you're thinking about discharge when uh, the patient first comes in, but they, uh, they're fully aware of what needs to happen before they can be discharged. Uh, uh, and also the junior doctor knows, the ward staff on, uh, the, the nursing staff know, and the patient and their relatives know. Mm -hmm. And just one final comment on there, whether people can, you know, remind me, but I think to discharge some, someone early in the day, they would actually need to, the script would need to be in the robot, robotic centre in Glasgow the day, be, the night before, would it not? It does. I mean, it, we, you know, so it's not, a, it's not, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, it's got to be there, but, or, or there's an automatic delay, as I'm, I think. It's not a matter. It would be nice for, for, for the for the script to be there the night before. It's almost got to be there the, the day before. It's got to be done, isn't it? Yeah, there can there are ways of getting the scripts obviously expedited for um, certain patients. But yes, the, the standard practice is to get the script down um, before a set time. But clearly, as the ward gets busier, the junior doctor may not get that script done. And then it's, it's delayed overnight. So th there are reasons in the system why, uh -huh. why there's delay. Is there any, is there any you know, way of circumventing that and you know, working with local pharmacy and, you know, and during a, a, you know, a, a, a busy winter period? Or, you know, it's just... I, I think what your point draws out maybe more strongly is the need to, at, at the point of admission and through care, be thinking about discharge. Aye. So that discharge isn't a surprise on the Tuesday morning, mm -hmm. um, in that discharge was contemplated on Sunday afternoon, and so that the steps that were going to be required are being taken, even if they're not things which are done directly <laughs> by the treating clinician, so that they understand that themselves themselves as being part of a system, um, and that you know, it's part of a system that they're interacting with the other health professionals to ensure that the individual gets the objective which they have, which is to return home as quickly as possible. So it's there's probably a mindset component as much as fixes that help when you haven't done the thinking properly. So, and that, that's the objective. Is there any other question? What we saw in Glasgow was this uh, centralised robotic dispensing to local dispensaries in the hospitals, but the patients also keeping their, their own medicines within, a, within a, a, a defined area within the ward. So that can be topped up and got ready for discharge. It seemed a, a very sensible approach, a combination of centralised robotics for the whole of Glasgow plus localised dispensing. So, I mean, Forth Valley has a variation on that, which works very well as well. Could I ask a final I've got a little point about patient flow um, just within the hospital as opposed to, you know, coming out, that, that clearly the issue of boarding out is quite a vexed one. Uh, we have a recording system in place, supposedly, but actually you have to define what's a boarding out. And I think Dr. Beckett and I have had conversations about this, and I just wonder if you'd like to put anything on the record on this, because I know he's done some work particularly on that area. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you're right. We've traded emails, and it's, it's, it's surprisingly difficult to, uh, to define uh, what uh, a patient who's boarded out is, but we've done that. We've, we've redefined that, and we're asking boards... Uh, to report on a weekly basis the number of, uh, of borders that they, uh, that they have. I think in, in terms of uh, patients being boarded out, it's important to recognise what that is and, and that boarding is a symptom of poor flow rather than boarding being the problem itself. There are, there are multiple manifestations of poor flow, so boarding patients being one, uh, crowding in the emergency department being another, high rehab mission rates being another. So um, if we were to tackle one of these in isolation, uh, then we would risk causing problems elsewhere in the system. Yeah. Uh, and clearly what we need to do and what we're looking at very carefully just now is how we improve patient flow across the whole system, measuring boarding as one, uh, as one uh, measure, outcome measure of that, also measuring performance against the four-hour standard in the emergency department as another, uh, as another um, 
uh, marker of that and and that's work that's being progressed through the unscheduled care steering group um, and uh, and the Un unscheduled care program board as an aside you'll know that we are looking to uh, that Scotland really is the only country that's done any research looking at the outcomes of patients yeah. who are boarded and we're looking to publish that I hesitate to put a date on that but within the next six months would be nice and the other issue I've been pressing in, in, in a number of forum is the uh, linkage of cognitive assessment to boarding out because the dangers of that. And I don't know where we've got to on that because clearly if you board out, if you have to board out patients and you board out people with cognitive impairment, that creates a further problem downstream of how you get them home and how they can be managed uh, because you institutionalise them further. They have particular difficulties if you move them around. So I just wonder where we are with linking those two systems which we've now got in place. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any direct linkage between the two. I know that a couple of health boards are looking to, to gather data on the proportion of uh, patients with cognitive uh, uh, impairment that, uh, that are boarded out at any one stage. But I think, the, uh, I think the, the message that I'd be keen to get across is that all boarding is, is, is bad and we should look to try, uh, we should look at eliminating all boarding through improving flow. Um, a lot of patients, clearly a significant proportion of patients that come into hospital uh, are, are elderly with cognitive impairment and we should be looking at making sure that those patients are getting to the right ward uh, first time through improving flow, looking at variation in the system. Uh, and I uh, say so that's, that's work that we're taking forward. And certainly work that we're doing in the, the, the steering group of the unscheduled care is, is around el eliminating boarding wherever we can. And um, I know that in the older people in acute health care um, audits of hospitals, uh, they, they go around and emphasise the importance of not boarding people with uh, cognitive impairment. We have done some particular work around dementia as a subgroup of uh, people with cognitive assessment or co cognitive impairment. And um, I, I could certainly pull together what we have on that, if that would be of help. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bob, I think we've got one last question in this area. Just really briefly, it's more of a mopping up exercise, so an opportunity to put some of this on the record. We mentioned right at the start um, uh, planned elective procedures being downsized in scale over the festive periods. So there will be less of them, and then some of them, depending on other pinch point pressures, may fall by the wayside as well. Um, I know that that's been routine, quite frankly, for, for, for many years in terms of managing winter stresses and strains. But within that, of course, what this committee would be concerned about would be particular elective procedures which are seen as urgent or emergency, perhaps cancer treatments, that kind of thing. So maybe just a few words on that to get something on the record in relation to that. I think it was mentioned right at the start of our evidence session today, it's just to get some of that on the record. Could, could I, I'll offer a couple of comments and then okay. I'll, I'll bring in Alan. Um, the, you know, this is certainly one of the areas where we expect NHS boards to be very much on the ball in terms of their winter planning in the elective by, 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 by the, the, the term indicates that this is planned work and so that they should be looking across the, the, the period of winter, particularly the two weeks around the, the, the part which is likely to be the most busy and to be thinking of smoothing work in such a way that you know, they're not relying on beds being available that not, might not be available. So some boards have also worked in that, in that way to think in terms of a nine rather than 12 as being their planning presumption. And, and that means that they're likely to be more robust in that area. So th th there, there is work already in place. The particular reference to cancer has been picked up in the, this year's winter guidance, which draws the attention of boards to the need to meet the 31 and the 62 day standard, and to be thinking again about that as part of their planning process across the winter period. Again, because 31 days and 62 days are longer than the 10 or so days of Christmas. So you know, there is the opportunity with robust planning for boards to perform effectively in that area. And so it's a particular area now, draw, now drawn out in the checklist which they're offered. But Alan will say a bit more about elective. Yeah, I mean, it's part of the, 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 the winter planning process and it's a, an escalation process that um, uh, you, the, the last patients that would ever get cancelled would be urgent patients. Um, and all the systems are geared to make sure that that, that doesn't happen. Um, uh, the Chief Medical Officer, uh, as Jeff said, wrote out on the 30th of October reminding uh, boards about the importance of planning for maintaining the, the cancer MDTs over the, the festive period and putting in place 
extra diagnostic support to maintain that if required. So our, our tried and tested systems are, and, and I've witnessed them, you know, the, it would not be the urgent patients or any cancer patients um, that would be cancelled if, if they have to. Um, but the, the, the objective is not to board patients into surgical beds wherever possible. So the first thing is to, to, to avoid that wherever possible. Thank you. Okay, I think that brings this um, very interesting um, session to a close. Um, can I thank you all for your attendance here and uh, the, the, you know, the extensive measures that, 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 that have been taken. You know, are, you know, you know you know, lots just looking over it over the last couple of days, and I think it was very interesting you coming along and, and, and speaking to that evidence. It's very significant planning measures indeed, and we, we wish you a very happy Christmas and, a, and uh, hope that all of that planning is rewarded by coping with all the stresses and strains over the Christmas and New Year period. Thank you very much for being here this morning. We're going to suspend very briefly, and we're going to go quickly to um, our points in the agenda.